Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to try to get underway. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Can you understand me, more importantly? A um, few housekeeping items to take care of. First, the bathrooms are straight across the hall right there, men's and women's. There's plenty of food down the hallway. On the left, there's a room on the left where we have food. We have coffee in. Right now, we're going to have small sandwiches at the break. The elevators are right here. And I want to say, give a special thanks to the town of Brantford for the use of this room, the fire department, Henry, who's without him, we don't do any of this stuff. He can't hear me. Um, if while I'm speaking, if I end up here today and you can't, I'm, too, I'm not understandable, just raise your hand and I'll say it again because I know I'm kind of hard to understand. That's Parkinson's. I have a question. How many Parkinson's disease patients do we have here? Could you raise your hand? Holy mackerel. <laughs> I, we were going to give you t-shirts. You, 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 these are my Be Kind t-shirts. You pick one up on your way out, OK? Be kind. We'll, together, we could change the world. I want to How many people are taking cinnamon? or dopamine. How many people have had DBS? Not many. How many people are considering DBS? Interesting. Is there anybody in David Russell's clinical trial? How's that going? I'm curious. Been taking this stuff? It's, it's intravenous. Is this, isn't it? You don't get the results um, For. from your input. I want to find out what uh, what is going on with me in progression. Uh huh. And Can you tell yourself? Can you feel different? You don't know if you're, you're getting this done, the, what's the placebo either, do you? There's no placebo. Um, I, is this, is this, I want the size of our meeting right now, where I think we're kind of about as big a crowd as we could have. Is this convenient for everywhere on this, this, this place right here? Because we could do it other places would rather have, like to have us too, like Yale or at, uh, Wallingford at the Masonic. This is think this is easier for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um. I'm going to be here. Allison's going to be the MC today because I can't speak that well. But um, I will be around here, standing around all day, and I can offer people. I've had DBS. I have just about every Parkinson's disease symptom you could have, including closing my eyes and speech and everything else. So if anybody wants to talk to me, I feel like an expert on DBS surgery. I've had five surgeries in the last six years. Um, before I get going, I'd like to make special thanks because I don't want to wait to the end in case anybody leaves. If any of you have ever done an event like this, you can't do it by yourself. Possible. My wife, Ian, I don't even know if she's here. Allison, I wouldn't even think about doing it without her. She's like the key to everything. My brother's here. Marty's over there with his Be Kind shirt on, finally. <laughs> Vicky. And who you should really thank is the guys in the back. Because they all gave money, money to CAP for this event, which allows us to, to have a little nicer event. We have Nancy Van Seabee, professional flowers made for us and everything, good food. Uh, we'll be sending out, a, I asked some questions this morning, but we're going to send out a survey monkey, which you'll get on your email. And if you please fill it out, just so that we know for next year, if we're going to do it again, what, what you prefer. Because we were deciding what to do and when to do it. Allison had a great event, I don't know how many went, in uh, April. The expo, were any of you there? Yeah. yeah. 
we were thinking that maybe we would combine the two events and have a bigger event, but we'll, we'll ask that question in the survey of Monkey. Um, lots of people to thank is the town of Branford and the police department. Thanks so much. Uh, now I'm going to give it over to Allison. And uh, by the way, the doctors. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Lavalley. D'Agostine, Dr. Vertel, and Dr. Buckingham. Here you go, Alice. Thank you, Ray. I'm going to pull this down because I'm height challenged. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Allison Kinney, and in case you don't know, I coordinate the Brantford Support Group for Parkinson's, and uh, if you don't come to the, or haven't been to the meetings before, we'd love to have you join us. Our next planned meeting is on Saturday, August 4th, and we have an African drum circle coming. So that should be a lot of fun. I'd like to, before I introduce the first doctor, I'd also like to thank uh, the team of people that I have helping me put this event on, the least of which are, is my sister Vicki and my, my sister-in-law Pat, and my sister Virginia and Lisa, all these wonderful people that have come to help me. They're all part of my team. They come to the support group, and we're all helping each other along the way. So we couldn't do it without them, so thank you. Our first doctor presenting today is Dr. Michelle D'Agostine, a board-certified movement disorders neurologist from the Hartford Healthcare, Health, Hartford Healthcare Medical Group. She earned her medical degree from Rochester Institute of Technology and is a member of the American Academy of Neurology, Movement Disorders Society, and Parkinson's Study Group organizations. Dr. D'Agostine will be speaking to us today about the latest updates in Parkinson's disease and treatment options. Dr. D'Agostine. working. I hate being behind the podium. So I'm, um, as she said, I'm Dr. Lavalle Dagsey, and I actually graduated from RIT undergraduate. Um, my medical degree was from Georgetown Medical School, and I went on to do my neurology residency there, chief resident year, and then two fellowships, one in neurophysiology and one in movement disorders. I'm a Connecticut native, so I moved back up here in 2010 to be back with my family, and I was in private practice doing movement disorders for five years before I joined David Russell at the Institute for Neurodegenerative Disorders to do research. My heart is in patient care, so I got pulled back with the Hartford Healthcare Group to see patients again, and I'm here today to give you an update. So this is a fabulous topic, cannot cover it in 45 minutes, so be kind, I've chosen just some highlights, this is exciting. I just want to start with a couple of facts, right? So Parkinson's disease is actually the most common movement disorder affecting one to two percent of the population over the age of 65. As we've gotten better at diagnosing people, we have actually moved the age, average age of onset down to 58. So the average age of onset is 58, and this can affect people in their 20s. My sister-in-law is 36 and was diagnosed at 34 years old. So this is something that affects people across the board. Uh, it's the second most common neurodegenerative condition uh, following Alzheimer's. So this is an epidemic, right? As we see the number of patients being diagnosed, the population is aging. We have 60,000 new cases a year in the United States alone, right? This has made scientists stand up and pay attention through the help of Michael J. Fox, patients like yourself, doctors such as like Dr. Patel at Yale and us at Hartford Healthcare, pushing, pushing for research. There are nearly 10 million people that are living with the disease worldwide right now. And in the time that I have to talk to you this morning, roughly five people will be diagnosed with Parkinson's, which is a little sobering, right? The five people in the time that we're sitting here are gonna be diagnosed with this disease. The signs and symptoms I think we're all pretty familiar with in this room. There are all the motor symptoms that were, were you know, talked about and, and are pretty obvious to us. The tremor, slow movement, uh, stooped posture, shuffling gait, difficulty with fine motor control. A lot of things that aren't talked about oftentimes, and I want to just draw a little bit of attention to are the non-motor symptoms, right? So the autonomic dysfunction, low blood pressure when you go from sitting to standing, you know, causing dizziness. This is underreported in a lot of people because they don't realize that this is part of their Parkinson's. And it's treatable. 
So not a brand new drug, but represented here today as Northera or Droxidopa, which is a medication to treat neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And in my practice in Danbury, we were part of the clinical trials, and what this drug does is it actually helps sort of replace a chemical in your body that you don't have enough of to help support blood pressure. So it's an important thing. So if you're getting from sitting to standing or laying down to standing up and you're feeling dizzy, lightheaded, fatigued, fuzzy, it's something to mention to your doctor because there's something we can do about it. Now there's a variety of ways to do this. I only mention Northera because it's a newer drug for our patient population and if you haven't heard of it, it's new to you. Sleep disorders are often underdiagnosed in Parkinson's patients, you know, REM behavior disorder being one of the most common, right, where you talk in your sleep or you act out your dreams. And a lot of patients come into my office and they don't know that this is a thing. They think that their spouse is being kind of weird. They don't know why they're doing it. The spouse has no idea that they're doing it. Um, and it can be as funny as someone thumping someone's head and thinking they're checking melons at the grocery store, but it can be as bad as curling yourself out of bed because you're, you know, you're fighting crime. So it's something that if it's happening, you need to bring it up to your doctor and again, we can, we can work with you on this. Um, the gastrointestinal symptoms, again, another one of these big areas that goes underdiagnosed and untreated in Parkinson's patients. We know that the gastric emptying in Parkinson's patients takes longer. So when you put in a pill or you have a meal, especially a high fat meal, your stomach is not releasing those contents as fast as someone without Parkinson's. The intestines don't move as quickly as someone who doesn't have Parkinson's. And so what we know is that if you check actually the bacteria in the gut of Parkinson's patients, it's different than the bacteria in the gut of non-Parkinson's patients. And this comes back to the whole microbiome sort of concept, right? Um, when we look at it, I'm gonna to get to this a little bit later, alpha-synuclein, right? These proteins that are found in Parkinson's patients that are sort of misfolded, we find them in the gut. In fact, there's a trial that wrapped up end of last year called the S4 trial, this alpha-synuclein sampling study, where we took biopsies from the skin, the colon, the salivary glands, we took cerebral spinal fluid and blood, and we find these abnormally folded proteins all over. And then neuropsychiatric, another area where in the time of shorter and shorter office visits with your doctor, you may or may not get to. Um, you know, a lot of Parkinson's patients will have depression or anxiety. Dopamine is a feel-good chemical, but also related to Parkinson's are changes in norepinephrine, changes in serotonin. It's difficult to bake a cake without flour, eggs, and oil. It's difficult to feel well when you don't have enough dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. So these are, you know, these are topics that you should be bringing up with your doctor if you're not feeling right. And I will tell you that depression in Parkinson's is not the same kind of depression that people sort of see on television with these ads. You know, depression still has a bit of a stigma to it, and you see these ads, and people think to themselves, I should be able to work my way through this. I can be tougher, I just gotta strap on my boots, I gotta get up and I just gotta do it. And, and that doesn't work that way. If you had diabetes, and you weren't making enough insulin with your pancreas, you wouldn't hit yourself in the side and say, make more. It's not gonna happen, right? You can't sort of bully your way out of it sometimes. Sometimes you do need a little bit of help, and so it is worthwhile to talk to your doctor about this. Another issue, which is you know, sort of a hotter topic, are hallucinations in Parkinson's. And some of you may or may not have seen the commercial for the sort of newer drug, Nuplazid. This was a drug that came on the market a couple years ago. Uh, I was part of doing the trials in my original office. And it's, it's interesting, in the past, we have had a lot of drugs for Parkinson's where we use a side effect of something else, right? Not really a drug that was de designed to treat our problems. So we sort of got the leftovers, we got the scraps. Not really fair. And with 60,000 new people a year being diagnosed, People are paying attention, and so we finally have drugs that are being designed for us, for our problems, for our needs, not the side effect of something else. So in the past, if you had a hallucination from Parkinson's or Parkinson's-related dementia, the way to treat it was to block your dopamine receptors. I mean, raise your hands. Who wants their dopamine receptors blocked when you've got Parkinson's? Nobody, right? So it leaves you in this terrible position as a physician where you have this poor patient who may be seeing things that are disturbing, and the only way to treat it is to block these receptors, and so, this drug came out in Nuplazid, which doesn't block dopamine receptors. It works on serotonin. And so again, it's not a brand new drug, but if you haven't heard of it, it's new to you. So that's my spiel on the non-motor symptoms. And now I'm gonna go into a little bit more of the meat. I'm putting this slide, um, just to give a little history, right? Because I think sometimes we forget in this fast-paced world, 
we haven't had levodopa available to us for all that long. In fact, there are many people in this room that in your lifetime, levodopa didn't exist, right? So one of the mainstays of our treatment, one of the gold standards is to replace the chemical in your body that you're not making, right? So it was isolated. L-dopa was only isolated, 1910, 1913, but it only really got into trials in 1961. 1967 is when we started using it in patients. So when we talk about you know, making progress and how far we've come, I think it gives a little perspective to know that we didn't even have the chemical until 1967, which was huge. So how do we address dopamine deficiency? So for the, for the motor symptoms for the most part. Um, so we can replace it, you know, we have L-dopa, cinematic, carbidopa, levodopa. Um, just replacing what your body is not making, right? This levodopa gets into the system and it gets converted into dopamine. We have different variations of this that some of you may or may not be familiar with. So Ritari is sort of a newer version of a long-acting levodopa. These capsules with little beads, so it's released over time, and the thought is that what's better for your body is to have a steady state, right? Because in our steady, in our normal state, so before Parkinson's, right, our body is making, producing, storing, and we're just sort of releasing dopamine as needed. And in Parkinson's, if you're not making enough, you're not storing enough, it's uncomfortable. That's where the discomfort comes in. That's where the disconnect comes in, right? Because your body's lacking a chemical that it needs to function. And so the thought is that if you're constantly peaking and crashing and peaking and crashing, this is uncomfortable, it's not great for you. And as the disease progresses, we see more of this because we lose our storage capability and our receptors become less sensitive. So there are newer formulations. Um, you know, Ritari, again, it's not brand new, but if you haven't heard of it, it's new to you. Um, and then there's Duopa, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. What I wanted to mention were the upcoming ones in just a second here, the accordion pill, there's a patch pump, and there's an inhaled form coming. We also try and mimic um, dopamine, we do this with dopamine agonists, right? So little chemicals that stimulate the dopamine receptor so your body thinks that it's getting dopamine. And this comes in several forms, Requip or Ropinerol, Murapex or Pramipexol, Nucro, which is a patch, again, not new, but if you haven't heard of it, it's new to you, right? Um, and Apokin, which is a, um, some people are familiar with this, it comes in a pen form right now. Apokin is an injectable rescue medication. It always surprises me when people have never heard of it because where I train down at Georgetown, we use this all the time. People up here haven't seemed to have been as familiar. It's a little scary, you know, it's sort of like an EpiPen. It's a rescue medication so that if you are off, you can take this pen and self-administer and within about 15, 20 minutes, you will be in the on state. Now it's not the right drug for everybody. It's a dopamine agonist. It works very quickly. It has a short half-life, but the pen is traditional, but it's been limited by people's desire not to really inject themselves. So in trials are these um, strips, sublingual strips that you can put under your tongue, sort of like those breath strips, right? Um, but a little bit nicer. Uh, and an apican pump. There's also DBS and functional ultrasound, but I'm gonna leave that to Dr. Patel. There are ways to recycle dopamine. So our bodies are very green, so to speak. So we, our nerves make, we, we make dopamine, we break it down, we tape back up the pieces, we make it again. And that's great if you can make tons of it. But if you can't make tons of it, that's not great. You don't want to break down dopamine when you're not making enough of it. And so we have several ways of helping to recycle what's already being made. Some of you may be familiar with selegiline, which is a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, right? MAOB. So just preventing, again, you breaking down that drug. Other people may have taken rusagiline or azelect, which is now generic, thank goodness. There is also a newer formulation called Zodago, which has a sort of interesting way that it works not only on MAOB, but also on glutamate. Glutamate's another uh, neurotransmitter in the brain, um, which is actually very important in the movement system and a topic of a whole other conversation, but this has an interesting mechanism. Um, and we have been fortunate to have this new drug on the market. The other way to recycle are with the COMT inhibitors. Some of you may know these as entacapone, or Stilevo, which has entacapone in it. Again, just prevents the medication from being broken down, so it keeps it in your system longer, stabilizes those blood levels, um, and there's a new version due out, we'll pick a pone. Um, I, I think my slides are cut off just a little bit. There's a, we're looking, obviously, always to reverse, right? And so, in about 2009, the Adagio trial was published, and Rosagiline or Azelect was thought to be neuroprotective. And unfortunately, which, and I say this with a, you know, heavy heart because we want nothing more than to reverse this disease, it, it did not pan out. You know, there were, when, it, when the data was presented in France, I think half the room wanted to put Rosagiline in everyone's drinking water. We thought it was neuroprotective, but as it turns out, it, you know, FDA really came back and looked at the data. It is not considered neuroprotective at this time. 
Um, and I'll get, since that slide is cut off, I'll get into the other ones as I go along here. I just want to take a minute to show you how the medications work. Um, these are your nerves, right, neurons, and you have dopamine receptors, and you have dopamine release, so you're making your dopamine here, right? You're putting it out here. In this space, this is where it's vulnerable to getting broken down, and that's where the monoamine oxidase B inhibitors work. These are the dopamine receptors here. It's like a lock and a key, and that's where your Nupro, your Mirapax, your, um, your Requip, that's where those are working. Um, so I just wanted to show you that quick cartoon there. Before I get into some information about trials, I want to just give you a little background, because not everyone here is familiar with trial data. And actually, Ray, you brought up a good point when you asked who's in David Russell's trials. David actually is the principal investigator in, all, in several trials, many different kinds. So imaging trials where you're just taking pictures. There are trials that when I was there, we were doing with the Michael J. Fox Foundation where you're gathering information. So some of you may be involved in the PPMI trial, which is the Parkinson's Progressive Markers Initiative. This is a very exciting trial where sites from all over the world have come together to gather data on Parkinson's patients, including their exams, images of their brain, cerebral spinal fluid for some people who are willing to do lumbar punctures, and gathering over time this data that is available to every reasonable sort of scientist in the world. So we're standing on each other's shoulders rather than working secretly in laboratories, right? That's how you really make progress. So with trials like PPMI, you, there's no placebo, there's no drug, you're just being followed. Right, so it's a natural progression study where these um, biopsies or spinal fluid is taken, where we're studying, looking for biomarkers. We're trying to diagnose people as early as possible. And with that kind of a study, there's, there's no, um, unfortunately, you're giving from your heart. There's no, they say in the paperwork, there's no benefit to you. You're helping the community, you're helping research, you're, you know, hopefully that translates into a cure so that everyone can be cured, but basically you're just sort of giving. You know, selfless people, and it's an amazing group of patients. The other trials that are being run there, I'm gonna actually talk about a little bit later. I think you were referring to the anti-alpha synuclein trials, um, and those trials are actually infusions of antibodies that are given, but in any drug trial in the United States, you have to have a placebo. Now, some people are allowed to be on other medications if they are considered standard of care, but to really determine whether or not a drug slows the progression of disease, it's got to be placebo controlled. And that is not open to the person who is running the study. It's not open to the patient. Um, and it, it's, there are laws against it, right? Because, you know, we would be biased. Can you imagine if I knew that, you know, Jane was on medication and Joe was not? Maybe in my mind, subconsciously, I would think, well, maybe Jane is doing a little bit better. So you've got to blind everybody to it. So the types of trials that we talk about are type one, which are very small. These are, these are very early trials, very small groups, looking at just safety. You're trying to find a dose, you're trying to see if it's safe. These are not designed to see if medication works. Uh, phase two, you get a little bit bigger, right? So now you said that they're safe. You're still primarily looking at safety data here, safety and dosing, and not as much in efficacy. You're looking, you wanna see a trend toward working. But these trials are not big enough to prove that a medication works. And this is where sometimes we get excited and then we get disappointed because things look really good in phase one and phase two. We do a lot of studies in mice. Mice have it made. Everything works on them. It's great. And then you bring it into people and it doesn't work so well. Phase three are the ones that you probably are the most familiar with. These are the ones that you kind of hear about on the news or um, you know, on PBS where things are really getting close to being approved, right? And the FDA wants to see two of these large trials, placebo controlled, large numbers. This is where, this is the meat, right? This is where we see, does it work? And this is where a lot of things fail. And then phase four is this continued sort of gathering of information afterwards, you know, where sometimes you hear four or five years later, there is a new side effect. Well, where does that come from? It comes from these. It's sort of a monitoring. Is there anything that we have missed that we didn't anticipate, um, that we didn't see in a two-year or a 52-week trial, right? Um, so formulations of levodopa in the pipeline. There is the accordion pill, which to its name, it looks like an accordion. And the goal of this is that it actually gets retained in the stomach for a long period of time. And so unlike the formulations that we currently have, even our best long-acting medication still has to be dosed three, four times a day, right? A oral medication of levodopa, which was, a, you know, um, a little frustrating for people. It's hard to take pills. It's very difficult to take something more than twice a day. That middle-of-the-day dose is a pain. And it's not fun to be reminded that you have the disease. If you're doing well, if you're busy, if you're having fun, it stinks to look down at your watch or have your spouse tap you and go, it's time to go take your pills. It's a crummy, crummy feeling. Um, and so the, the thought with this, again, is that um, it's a phase three. It's going to be wrapping up in September of this year, and that hopefully we'll see a good demonstration that there's a good, long, 
lasting blood level, right? So to really get approval now, you have to show that you're better than the standard. So the FDA is not gonna approve a new medication if it's no better than what we've got, right? So you've gotta show that this is actually, there's a benefit to it. So that's exciting, that would be great you know, if you had a 12 hour pill. The Neuroderm patch pump, is exciting. This is in phase two, so it's a little bit earlier. Um, and the phase two wrapped up in May of this year, so we're waiting on some data. Patients are not completed with it. They're just done recruiting. This is actually a pump. So anyone who's familiar with um, insulin pumps, right? So it's external. It just goes right subcutaneously under the tissue. And then the thought is that it would just run levodopa in a formulation in the background so you can set it and forget it, right? That you can just sort of go. It's a little cumbersome, right? Because it's on the outside of your body, but I think most people still would prefer that to popping pills all the time. Again, it's not the right drug for everybody, um, but it's exciting. That's an exciting thing. Like we're looking to mimic what your body would normally be doing and by running things sort of continuously all day long, that's the hope. And then the last one, which is pretty darn close to being approved, CVT-301, I didn't name it, um, is actually a rescue levodopa. Again, kind of think about like your Apokin pen or your rescue inhaler if anyone has a friend or family member with asthma, you inhale it. It's inhaled levodopa and the thought is that it rescues you from an off state. So if you take a medication, you take a dose, it fails. Um, for whatever reason, you've had a very, very high protein rich meal, you've been sitting too long, something comes up and you can't move. We want to have something in your, you know, in your, in your repertoire so that you can take it and get back and get going, right? And not be stuck for hours. These are also helpful for early morning off time. Early morning off time, so difficulty kind of getting started, is one of the number one complaints people have, right? Because that's what, what takes you the longest, right? It's so hard. You get up, you got to get dressed, you've got to brush your teeth, you've got to do all your ADLs. But if it takes you three hours to get going, that's the worst time to have to be productive, right? I mean, you know, so it would be nice to have things that can kind of get you started or going early in the morning. So those are exciting. The next one is that sublingual apomorphine strip that I mentioned. So this is an apokin strip, and you can see it just, it's a little tab that would be going underneath the tongue. This is in phase three trials. So again, very exciting, non sort of injection ways to do things. Um, and again, it's just, it's a rescue medication so that you, if you were in the off state, you know, if your medication wasn't working, if you were having some off time, you can go ahead and put this under your tongue and then the thought is that within a reasonable period of time you could get up and go. There's the Apokin pump, so looking at another pump, again, we're looking at all these things to try and really stabilize blood levels. Apokin is a dopamine agonist, so working on those receptors, making your body think that it's getting dopamine. Um, and so the pump is actually in trials right now. Again, it's subcutaneous, so it would be similar to that insulin pump another pump which is already on the market, and if you don't know about it, it is new to you, is Duopa. So Duopa is a gel form of levodopa that actually goes in through a tube that is threaded through the stomach and then into the upper intestines. So you actually completely bypass the stomach altogether. Interestingly enough, a lot of people think that this is brand new. It's not new. We had done trials of this back at Georgetown in 2010, and it's been available in Europe for a lot longer than we've had it here, I think almost 20 years at this point. And um, the way that it works is that you get a little cartridge in the morning, you click it into this pump, which is, you know, not, it's not too big, um, and you hit go. It gives you your morning dose. We titrate you in the office to basically be on, in the on state within about 30 minutes. And if you're not, we adjust your doses in the office. Um, and then it runs at a steady state all day long. We, as your neurologist, calculate the dose that you need and we make adjustments as necessary, but it just runs in a nice steady state all day long for a total of 16 hours. You can give yourself an extra dose if you're feeling off, if you feel like something isn't working, and if you've decided to have a state, can you give yourself an extra dose? If you wanna go swimming, you can give yourself an extra dose, close it off, tuck it in, tape it up, go swimming, you get about two hours off, and then you can come back on and, and reconnect your pump. So you, there's really nothing you kind of can't do with it. Um, and I have a lot of people who will give themselves an extra dose right before bedtime, flush the tube, and go to bed. And they, typically speaking, you can come off of most of your oral medications with this, and it's pretty, pretty fantastic. It's, it's been a real lifesaver for a lot of my patients. Through those already. So the next sort of section, you have to cut me off if I'm going too long, is the non-dopaminergic research. So we hear a lot about dopamine, but oftentimes what is left out are the, the parts that are not related strictly to dopamine. So talking about that alpha-synuclein that I mentioned earlier, and there's a couple that I wanted to just go through. These are sort of the hot ones right now. So nilotinib, uh, inosine, the anti-alpha-synuclein vaccines, the anti-alpha-synuclein antibodies, is ratapine, and then a couple more that fell off the slide here. So 
Nilotinib, for those of you who are saying, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. You know what I'm talking about. A couple years ago, at a conference in Chicago, data was presented by my mentor, Dr. Pagan, from Georgetown about a chemotherapy drug that was going to revolutionize Parkinson's, and it, it was amazing, and everybody wanted to take it, even though it wasn't approved, right? So it may be ringing some bells in people's heads now, because we had a lot of calls to the office. People wanted to go on this. And the thought, really, with this is that, you know, it's already approved for chemotherapy, for patients who have cancer, you know, why can't we speed this ahead for Parkinson's patients? Well, because the risk that you're willing to take when you have cancer is very different than the risks that you're willing to accept if you have Parkinson's. So looking at safety is very important. The thought is that the drug may reduce damage to the cells in the brain that are affected by Parkinson's, and it may reduce the levels of this toxic protein inside the cells, which we think sort of muck it up, so to speak. So the PD nitalotamib the trial in 2016 only had 12 patients. It was a very early phase trial. This trial was designed, as much as I love Dr. Bacon, this trial was designed to show that it didn't kill 12 people. That's all it was proved. That's all that was proved in this trial. That's all it did. Now I saw the videos. I have colleagues who still work there. They were raving. It was exciting. But unfortunately, like I said, we, if you've been in research long enough, we've seen this before, we get very excited when 10 people do very well. But it doesn't translate to 600 people. It doesn't translate to 1,000 people, right? So it was an exciting trial. You have to have these proof of concept trials. You have to do these to push the science to move forward. But we always tell people to be just a little bit careful, right? Because all this showed was that 12 people didn't die. That's it, right? Um, not trying to rain on the parade, right? But I'm just, you know, just be honest. And that's why we usually don't recommend people take medications not approved to treat Parkinson's unless there's good data. Case in point, if you look at the QE3 trial, right, where we had a trial for CoQ10. Again, these darn mice, they have it made. In the NIH, in the lab, in the cell cultures, you know, you have these rodent models. They did great, these high doses of CoQ10. They were, they were doing fabulously. You put high dose CoQ10 into Parkinson's patients compared to control, the study actually had to be stopped prematurely because when they did an interim safety analysis, the Parkinson patients on high doses were progressing at a faster rate than people who were taking a sugar pill, right? And so that was a sobering moment, I think, for a lot of us where in the past you would say, well, go ahead and try it. You can probably, it's not gonna hurt you, but maybe it will. So I think sometimes when you find your doctor to be a little cautious and say, no, I'm not gonna prescribe these sort of off-label things, in the back of your doctor's head, it may be because we've seen something like this. Um, so right now, they are doing a phase two trial, uh, Nilo PD, and it's placebo control. They're enrolling 135 patients, and this is to, you know, to test safety and tolerability. So this is exciting. I think that there's a lot more to be coming you know, with this drug. I just think we have to be a little bit cautious, and again, don't recommend off-label usage. Inosine is another popular one that people often ask me about, and there, uh, you know, there are several trials, Shore PD, Shore PD3. Um, this really came from this doctor, Dr. Gal, from Pennsylvania State University. And what they did is they have these long-term health studies where they gather all this data and then you can go back and you can search certain parameters and sort of look and try and find correlations. And when he looked, he found that people who had these high levels of uric acid, men specifically, not women, had a lower rate of Parkinson's disease. So unfortunately for us ladies, much like many other things, it, it was not significant for us, but for our uh, lovely counterparts it was. And so. Inosine is a drug that keeps uric acid levels higher, and so through the Parkinson's study group, um, there have been several trials that have been going on. Um, and again, sure, PD3 is a phase three trial, which is, I think, wrapping up, and um, hopefully we'll have some good data on that. The vaccines are always a big topic, and I will say that, um, so, Ephiphorus um, just actually posted some data. They've had a four-year, um, sort of follow up and it fell off the bottom of my slide here. Um, it's, it's for your data. They, so there's two vaccines. There's way to, ways to vaccinate people and vaccines are, are always a topic of controversy but you can actively vaccinate or passively vaccinate. Active vaccinations are the ones you're probably the most familiar with. So for example, if you get a flu shot, right? So you get this vaccine, your body makes antibodies to the flu and then hope the thought is that if you get exposed to it, you're not gonna get it, right? That's what, um, that's what the hope was for this PDE01A and 03A, is that you would receive these infusions of this vaccine. It's not a one-time deal. 
It's a lot of these are, you know, sort of once a month, two hour infusions. So it's not a, it's not as simple as a, you go to the CVS, you get your Parkinson's vaccine and then you, you roll out. I mean, hopefully someday we have that. I and mean, how fabulous would that be? You know, okay guys, let's go get our Parkinson's vaccine with our shingles vaccine and you're good to go. That would be great. Um, this is a little bit more cumbersome, but you know, I'd go in once a month if I knew that I had a two hour infusion and I'd never get Parkinson's. Um, so the 01A phase 1B, so these are early, 24 people, early, early, but you have to establish that they're safe. One of the biggest problems is that, you know, when you're trying to create vaccines against, against alpha-synuclein, we have to remember that alpha-synuclein has a functional role in our body. And so what you don't want to do is go and take out something that you need to function and then find out, find out 10 years later or five years later that you've taken out this critical functioning, you know, protein that you needed and now you've created a huge problem. So again, very small, um, a lot of these were short, but 14% of patients in the initial trial didn't respond, but 42% um, didn't need additional medication over a three year period and the data that was, was um, preliminary put out last week was that over a four year period, there was a certain percentage of these patients that were stable. Other antibodies, the one that we were sort of talking about, Ray, like with Dr. Russell at IND and obviously other locations, these are all over the place. Um, it's come, a couple of the big ones are the Pasadena trial and then the Spark trial, so Roche and Biogen. A lot of different companies are involved. They've got these anti-alpha synuclein agents and they're packaged in a variety of ways, but what happens is that you go in and you get an infusion and this is the passive vaccination. So this infusion, actually the goal is to seek out, target these, these misfolded alpha-synuclein um, proteins and clear them from your system. And they work all in sort of different ways. Some are trying to get them outside of the cell, some are trying to get them inside the cell. Um, there are some that are trying to reduce the clumping. So if you look at Neuropore, which is in phase one, or Proclara, which is actually an Alzheimer's study but is targeting alpha-synuclein. These are very early studies, but they're trying to either stabilize this protein to make sure it doesn't form this toxic folded conformation or to prevent it from clumping, that they're very specifically targeting this alpha-synuclein. Is ratapine is another one we get asked about all the time. This is a calcium channel blocker. This is the big one where people say, well, can't you just put me on it? I have a little bit of high blood pressure and I've got Parkinson's, can't I just take it? You know, this one I'm a little bit more lenient on because again, you can use it for hypertension. But the thought with this is that if you stabilize calcium, the, the calcium actually sort of binds to the end of this alpha synuclein protein, which can sort of cause cell destruction, cell death. And then if you can stabilize the calcium, um, by blocking the channels that you actually have some protective quality. Uh, this actually, the last patient I believe is due to complete in November of this year. The earlier trials have been promising, so we all have our fingers crossed. Uh, the last one I get asked a lot about is diabetes and Parkinson's. So are the, there are these glucagon-like peptides, GLP-1, right? And we use them in diabetes because in the gut they stimulate the release of insulin. It's interesting because their receptors are also found in the brain. And in Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's patients have a reduced glucose tolerance and you have impaired signaling with glucose, which in turn leads to increased, we think, levels of this toxic alpha-synuclein and cell death. So the thought is that you can use these GLP-1 agonists, right, because they're already approved, you've gone through the safety, you know that you're not gonna, you know, spend a lot of time in these phase one, phase two trials demonstrating safety um, and see if they work in Parkinson's. And so there are several trials. The exenatide agonist uh, is in phase two, with a phase three likely. Uh, this was actually a, four, they did a 48-week trial, which was very nice. And then this lixitenatide is uh, due to be starting a trial in France, I believe beginning in 2020. So I went through a lot of information. I'm not covering, obviously, DBS or neuromodulation because that is Dr. Patel's uh, talk. I tried to cover as much as I can. There's certainly many, many, many more updates, but uh, wanted to keep it as concise as possible. Any questions? You inhalation one uh, in the early part of your talk. Who's developing that? Uh, the question is for the inhalation one. Who is developing that? The inhalation. Uh, uh, it's a corda. Thank you. That's right. I met, yeah. I was looking at some of the preliminary data with their um, one of their farm farm D's the other day, and it's actually pretty exciting. Thank you. Have you heard about a study that talks about increasing the microvasculature in the brain, brings healing substances <coughs> to the substance <coughs> nigra and the basal ganglia, and is good or is promising for treatment part? Right, so the question was, have I heard about a study to help with the microvasculature? 
Right, to increase the microvasculature. To increase the microvasculature of the brain. To increase blood flow. No, I'm not familiar with one of those. I mean, I, I think that that's, it's interesting that, you know, one of the big problems that we have in Parkinson's, um, right, is so if you increase blood flow there, you, it would be tricky to, to do just there, right, without having a risk of stroke, without having a risk of having increased vessel growth, which could lead to malformations, which can lead to stroke and intracerebral hemorrhage. The other sort of big issue with that is that back in the 1990s, um, so I don't know that blood flow is the problem. That's the issue. It's not a stroke, right? So you can have vascular Parkinsonism, meaning that you have had infarcts. You've had strokes to the basal ganglia. You can look like you have Parkinson's, but you don't respond to medication because you don't actually have the disease, right? Um, but blood flow is not really the issue. The issue we think, right, is that you have the death of these cells. We think that a big part of it is this toxic alpha synuclein. When they did the... Um, stem cell trials back in the 1990s, a lot of those patients were, were giving enough to donate their brains for autopsy when they did finally pass. And what we found was that even though they got the stem cells in, they kept them viable, looked like they produced dopamine, those stem cells had acquired toxically folded alpha-synuclein, which is a big problem, right? So that, that if that's what's killing your cells, and you put new cells in, it doesn't help you if those new cells sort of acquire it right away. So I don't know necessarily that blood flow is the key. Did you mention apomorphine? I did. So the question was, did I mention apomorphine? So apomorphine is apokin. So currently apomorphine is available in that injection, that sort of rescue pen. Uh, but then there's also several more formulations that are uh, in the pipeline, the, the tab under the tongue, and then the pump, the continuous pump. Any connection between Parkinson's and Crohn's disease? That's a great question. So the question was, is there any connection between Parkinson's and Crohn's disease? That is being looked at. I don't have a definitive answer, but we there is a connection, we believe, in the gut and Parkinson's. Uh, it remains unclear. You know, we When we're doing the sampling studies, we know that we can have these toxically folded proteins found in the in the gut decades before you're actually diagnosed with Parkinson's. Diagnosed with Parkinson's. You know, we know that people can be in this sort of prodromal phase, preclinical phase for 15, 20 years, long time. That's why we're working very hard to identify what are the risk factors. And if you look at the, the PAR study through the Department of Justice, they're trying to identify, is it loss of sense of smell, is it REM behavior disorders, is it chronic constipation, what, you know, family history, what can we put together that identifies you as someone who might be of higher risk? And then if you look at like the PPMI and the S4 trials, how can we do a minimally invasive study, a test, a biopsy, a blood sample, an imaging, you know, an imaging study where we can say, okay, you were at risk, and we want to catch it before you clinically have it. We want to catch you in this early phase. The thought being that if you can catch it before someone clinically manifests symptoms, then perhaps if you had an effective anti-alpha-synuclein agent or something of that nature, you could start getting those infusions early so that you would not progress and may never develop clinical symptoms. I think that's, that's my pie. There was a recent um, study that came out, I think a week or two ago, about yeah. inflammatory bowel disorders, and it seems like ulcerative colitis is associated with the increased risk of Parkinson's and Crohn's pain. So, with Dr. Patel was saying, it was in movement last, yeah. last week, right? Yeah. In our movement disorder journal, like last week or two weeks ago, they did publish a study linking ulcerative colitis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease to Parkinson's, but that was just one, one study. Yeah. Um, it's still an open question, but yeah. certainly people are looking at the link. In, um, excuse me. Did, was there a study where people, yeah, overseas where people who had the vessel the vagal nerve to sort of right, so the out, nobody got Parkinson's and had it cut off? Right, so, the, so what Ray's saying, so there was a study looking at the, the vagal nerve, right, so this innervation where if you had a, for, for various reasons, people have their vagus nerves cut. And the, what was observed was that people who had this vagus nerve cut didn't seem to have the rate of Parkinson's that people who obviously did not have the nerve cut did. These are very hard studies to do because there's a lot of confounding factors, right? So you, these are retrospective, right? So you're not looking forward and saying, I'm going to cut your vagus nerve and then see if you develop Parkinson's, right? And, well, that's the problem, right? These are all observational <laughs> retrospective studies. We look at these big groups, right? And you say there's a trend. Interestingly enough, though, in research, and one of the things that I sort of love, but you know, my sister-in-law hates when I say this, um, is that you can actually, if you plot uh, the temperature of the world and the number of pirates, I said pirates, <laughs> you can imply that as the number of pirates increased, global warming did as well. 
<laughs> now, just because you can imply that does not mean that, par that pirates have anything to do with global warming. So we try and be very careful with these kinds of studies and observations. You know, and Dr. Patel and I are big nerds, you know, we look at the data. We always take it with a grain of salt because just because you can imply a, a, a correlation doesn't mean there's causation there, so we don't know. I truly think that there is a, a tie to the gut. I really honestly do believe that, and I think it's going to come out. I just don't think we have strong enough data right now to overwhelmingly make a paradigm shift. Does that have to do between chronic migraine and Parkinson's? Right, it's so a question about chronic migraine and Parkinson's. I don't know that there have been any great papers published on migraine and Parkinson's. I will tell you that if you have migraine and you have, you know, stiff muscles, right, I think one of the areas often overlooked is the musculature of the neck when you're treating Parkinson's patients with regards to cervical dystonia, heavy elevation of the shoulder. Everything's tight in. So if all the muscles are tight and all these muscles back here are all pulling on each other, it's going to take you know, if you have migraines, it's going to make them much worse. I think that's one of the areas a lot of people sort of don't always get to if you're not seeing a movement disorder specialist. I think we need to wrap up, right? Yeah, are you going to be staying for questions? Yeah. Oh, well, she's, Dr. Laval is going to be here staying for questions and answers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I had a couple of questions for Alice and it's on. One is, all this stuff costs money, and I have had a lot of, not a lot, but I've had a lot of battles down, you know, with uh, insurance and all that stuff. There's been some real good changes they've made, but it's very expensive. If anybody's thinking of surgery or any of that stuff down there, I can kind of point you in the right direction. Sorry. Okay. I'd like to thank Dr. D'Agostine for her very informative talk. And I'd like to introduce our next valued speaker, Dr. Amar Patel. Dr. Patel is an assistant professor of neurology and movement disorders at Yale School of Medicine. He received his medical degree at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I'd like to welcome Dr. Patel. Thanks very much. Um, I'll stand behind the podium, it makes me feel smarter, <laughs> or professorial. Um, uh, that was a great talk by Michelle. I forget half of the things that are in phase two and three trials, and, and then every year when you go to a conference, you realize, oh, that is coming out soon. And uh, I hope to look forward to, to a lot of these things coming to fruition. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neuromodulation, which is a fancy word for changing the brain in an active way. Um, it, it's become kind of a buzzword. Um, people create centers for neuromodulation and try to adopt different technologies to affect a number of conditions. And we'll try to focus on a few uh, advances in uh, deep brain stimulation in particular over the last few years, um, things we can look forward to in the future for deep brain stimulation, as well as a number of non-invasive modalities or treatment um, types that may be uh, worthwhile in the Parkinson's community as well. So, um, is there any way we can in raise the level of the uh, PowerPoint? There's just a couple of points. Uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll remember what's on the slide, but just in case. Uh, it's a Saturday, and I, I don't know. It's really nice out, and so I get distracted <laughs> easily. Um, just so we're all on the same kind of uh, level of, uh, of knowledge about what DBS is, for Parkinson's patients, this is a surgical treatment for the complications of what we call advanced Parkinson's disease. So this is a treatment for patients who have had Parkinson's for maybe four or five years or longer who um, are dealing with a number of cardinal features um, or challenges. One is um, motor fluctuation. So somebody gets a good response to leave the dopa, but they find they have to take uh, the pill every couple of hours to stay on, or they suddenly fall off in terms of their motor function. Um, another group might be uh, a group of patients who uh, also experiences a good response to levodopa, but finds that it works almost too well. It causes bothersome dyskinesia. They can't sit still in the chair. Their arms are flailing, and they really have a hard time controlling their body. You know, these movements that we sometimes see Michael J. Fox make, uh, Michael J. Fox make in public are, are the most common example of dyskinesias. And then the last group probably is uh, patients who have a lot of tremor from Parkinson's. And for some reason, the medications just doesn't really do enough 
for the tremor. The surgical option can be uh, much more effective for tremor than oral therapy. So those are the three big categories of, of people that can benefit from DBS. And it's um, you know, been a, a technology that's been uh, developed in the early 90s, has been used routinely over the last 20, 25, 30 years now, and continues to expand and um, remains a, a great option for patients who are dealing with those fluctuations. Uh, this is just an example of some of the procedures. So the procedure involves the placement of, uh, and I have a few other photos, but in this scheme, the, the electrode is this thin wire that is anchored to the skull and advanced down into the basal ganglia, which are the structures in the brain responsible for some of the patterns of uh, movement difficulties that we have in Parkinson's. And that electrode is anchored to the skull and a wire is run under the skin down into the chest and it's cut off a little bit here, but there's a, what looks like a battery for a pacemaker and essentially they are very similar. Um, and that battery will then generate a pulse at that area, at that tip of that electrode to modify the symptoms of Parkinson's. This is an example of the frame that helps the surgeon place the electrode and a, an example of an awake procedure. The surgeon is in the back here working on the brain while the anesthesiologist and other uh, people testing are up front. This is just a stock photo. I'm nowhere in that photo, so it's okay. You don't have to look very hard for me. Um, uh, the photo would look much better with me in it, so I assure you. So, um, Again, it's cut off a little bit, but you can see this is the tip of the electrode, and at each electrode, traditionally, uh, you have a contact, and there are four different contacts that you can turn on and off and course electricity through, and you can change the amount of voltage or current delivered to each source, you can change how long that electrical pulse is delivered, and you can change how frequently it's given, and that's the way we modify the electrical signal to affect the clinical changes that we see in the office. And this is a schematic of the result of that. So for example, if you change the voltage and the duration of that electrical pulse, you can get a certain type of field of activity, this kind of brown circle. And the targets for Parkinson's disease are the globus pallidus or the subthalamic nucleus, the GPI or the STN, for example. And so you can imagine you want to stimulate that target, but you don't want to stimulate something next to the target. So a common area that we try to avoid stimulating is the internal capsule. That's the highway for nerve cells uh, going from the brain to the body that tell your body to move. So you can imagine if you make too big of a field, you could activate that pathway and all of a sudden somebody in the office might get a spasm in their hand or their face or suddenly tingling in their, in their hand or their, I don't think I have any electronics on me, but um, it's just my magnetic personality. Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, so you can imagine that could be very bothersome. So you can adjust those parameters, the voltage, the pulse width, and now you can move that electrical field away from that internal capsule and towards just the target you want to affect. So that's the principles of how we, in the office, uh, manage uh, this type of device. Um, again, it's been available for quite a while, uh, approved for the treatment of tremor specifically, um, uh, in the late 90s, although people had been using it earlier than then. And again, for the fluctuations of Parkinson's disease in the early 2000s, but again, people had been using it earlier than then as well. Um, and every year, the people kind of expand the use of, of these types of devices. We, there, I don't, uh, there is a somewhat rare condition, the primary dystonias, which uh, this can be effective for very severe cases. Um, even psychiatric indications, so obsessive compulsive disorder, very treatment resistant obsessive compulsive disorder, was an approved indication in 2009. And all of these conditions have different targets that you want to place the electrode in to get the right clinical effects and different ways of programming those settings that we were talking about. Um, we can add epilepsy to this list now, actually, um, with DBS to the thalamus. Um, and a, a lot of that work was done by our epilepsy colleagues at, at Yale. So it's a, it's a technology that continues to expand in the, in the ways that we think about using it. It's not without its complications. Certainly, it's a brain surgery. It's not the most complex brain surgery, if you ask me, a non-brain surgeon. But it is a brain surgery nevertheless. Um, so there is a risk of people having a stroke, a low risk, but a, but a serious uh, consideration, uh, bleeding during the procedure, a lifetime risk of infection. You know, you have a piece of hardware in your skin. If you happen to get a, a cut or bruise that doesn't heal or erosion of the skin and that can infect the hardware, we wouldn't want that infection to track into the, all the way up on the equipment into the brain 
that could be very devastating. So that's a low but risk but serious risk. Um, in the lifetime of the procedure, the electrode could move you know, small changes in its position, or it could have a fracture. This is less of a, of a problem with more modern technology, but again, these are, this is an elective procedure, and so nobody should rush into this with, without considering these types of rare but serious effects. How does DBS work? Uh, we don't really know. Um, this is a plug for one of my favorite shows on the History Channel called Ancient Aliens or, or Aliens in History. Basically, they take a historical concept and claim that aliens were responsible for it. And this guy uh, with this fantastic haircut is a common uh, uh, commenter. Anyway, that's a small digression. But uh, I'm being a little facetious. We, we, we have an understanding of maybe the pathways that it's affecting. But fundamentally, if you said, how does it work, we, we honestly don't really know that that fundamental concept. Previously, people thought that, well, if you put this electrical stimulation, you're blocking something. You're turning something off. And that um, is uh, because uh, prior to DBS, people would do uh, lesioning surgeries, where you would put an electrode in, and you would burn a hole in the area of the brain responsible for a tremor or a dyskinesia. And then people realized, well, you don't have to burn the hole. You can leave the electrical stimulation on. So this stimulation must be doing the same thing that the burning hole is doing. We must be turning something off. And as we study it more and more, we realize, well, that's not really right. We're turning some things off, and we're turning other things on in totally unconnected places. And so really, there's a network of activity that Parkinson's has. There is an, uh, a highway system that uh, cars on the, go on for Parkinson's disease, and there's a highway system that, uh, uh, that we have before we develop Parkinson's disease. And it seems to be that dopamine or deep brain stimulation helps the cars get back onto the highway that we used to have before we had Parkinson's. So there's a much more global effect. And that's a pretty picture of random scans of brains with different colors on it to reflect the network effect of, of those conditions. Um, but I will say, again, one of the challenges is that you know, if we fundamentally don't know how exactly this is working, that's one of the challenges of developing a technology or refining a technology to better deliver uh, therapy for patients. So we'll talk about a few recent advances. Um, uh, in 2015, Medtronic was able to get their systems approved for full body. Um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this is a, a different slide. So uh, we'll talk about the technique first. Um, uh, I showed the picture earlier of the the drape on the patient and the surgeon behind and the anesthesiologist in front, traditionally this procedure was done uh, uh, awake. So there would be some light anesthesia, not so light, uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty heavy when they're actually cutting the skin or uh, cutting the skull. But then as the electrode is advanced into the proper site, uh, the patient would wake up so we could see the symptoms that they were having. And we could listen to the activity of the brain cells as you're passing through different structures because the target that you want to affect has a certain quality and characteristic different from all the other uh, uh, parts of the brain. And you can even hear the tremor uh, from the activity of the brain cells as you see somebody shaking. Or as you move their elbow, you can hear the brain cells activate. Oh, this is the, the cell responsible for the elbow. This is responsible for the wrist. And you can refine where that electrode is going so that you know it's going to the right spot. You could also turn on the device in the operating room and see the tremor go away. Again, another reassuring sign that you've put the electrode in the right spot. Um, you could also even test at higher voltages, where do I get side effects, so that when you come back to the office in a week or two and we turn you on, we have a report that says, you know what, this is probably the best place to start with, and, and avoid this contact because there were some side effects there. So that, that's certainly helpful, but um, I can imagine uh, a lot of patients saying, I'm going to be awake for my brain procedure, and no. No, this is, this is crazy. What do you, t you know, I'm not going to sign up for this. And then there's the other group that desperately wants to be awake, and we send them to a psychiatrist, and then <laughs> the, we, we question their sanity a little bit. Yeah. But so uh, that's a barrier to adopting this technology. And uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, a little bit longer, uh, people have been adopting fully asleep techniques where you can have the patient fully asleep with a general anesthesia. Um, you can have an MRI in the operating room, and here's an example of kind of a schematic of that, with a frame and a device to introduce 
the electrode that's all MRI compatible, and it takes into account the spatial orientation of this electrode with the anatomy of the patient in the OR, getting the MRI right there. And you can target just by what the target looks, uh, looks like on the MRI and, and put the electrode directly in there. So patients can be asleep for the whole thing, they wake up, and, um, and they didn't have to go through that uh, somewhat challenging uh, intraoperative monitoring phase. Um, and people were a little reluctant. You know, we, we like to do the things that we're accustomed to doing, and we've been doing it that way for a long time. And it's reassuring when you turn the device on in the operating room and see the tremor go away, or you see that ah, they weren't having side effects. So it was a little bit slow to adopt. But as we get more experience with this type of technology, um, large series of patients have been reported in the last two years that show there's really no difference in how accurately you're putting the electrode. Um, it seems to be just as accurate to do it asleep using just the MRI as opposed to having somebody awake and using this microelectrode recordings, as we say. Um, and if you look at patients six months, 12 months out, they have the same outcomes. So there certainly seems to be no drop off in the two um, procedures. And there may actually be an improvement in the amount of avoiding bleeding or infection. That's a little questionable. I tend to think of these procedures as equivalent, but uh, it's a possible benefit of these. And I think more and more patients, certainly at our center, are adopting a fully asleep procedure just for their own comfort. Um, you know, anxiety uh, can be a certain, certainly a symptom of, of Parkinson's that we're all dealing with. And the idea of uh, of going through that kind of a procedure awake is, is pretty daunting for many patients. So anything that expands the ability to deliver this type of therapy is certainly, is certainly welcome. Um, here's what I was alluding to earlier um, in December of 2015 using the traditional Medtronic system. Uh, people now are able to get fully um, uh, full body MRIs with certain conditions and caveats. Um, previously, you could only get a brain MRI in certain areas, uh, in certain techniques. Now you can get a full body MRI. And it seems like a small advance. Uh, nothing changed about the technology. They just proved that it was safe for that technology to be in the MRI scanner in the suite. Um, and it can be done in certain settings with the stimulation still on, depending on how the configuration of that, uh, that battery is made uh, or set. And it, it's made a big difference for a number of patients over the last few years who have had you know, critical spinal stenosis, a tightening in the neck uh, of the vertebra of the neck, impinging on the spinal cord, causing gait problems, which is an often under-treated uh, or underestimated um, uh, contributor of gait difficulties in Parkinson's disease. Um, as we get older, we certainly are at risk for those kinds of things. And a, and a patient was able to get a, uh, actually a few months after this was approved, get a full body MRI. And, uh, you know, I got, the, I, I had asked her to go to the emergency department. She said, no, I'll compromise and get the MRI. And so then I had to call her and say, now you have to go because we got the MRI results. And she had to have surgery for a, a herniated disc. Um, to, and her walking improved dramatically after that. So the ability to get uh, an MRI is really important. Um, our patient population certainly deal with orthopedic issues, hip replacements, knee replacements, which would be nice to have that kind of diagnostic uh, test available. Um, in the last couple of years, the electro technology has changed a bit, um, and people are um, utilizing these segmented leads uh, to do what's called directional current steering. So I'll refer you back to our initial um, uh, slides about how the electricity is delivered. It's just kind of a sphere or an oval of, of current. And once you set it, you want it to go to the places you, you want to affect and avoid the places nearby. Um, so what this uses is a, a divided lead. Um, to try to give you more flexibility in that programming. So traditionally, the whole contact is active, that whole cylinder around the electrode. Um, and what some companies have put out are these segmented leads that are divided into three spots. So you could imagine you can turn on just one of these segments and push the current to one side and avoid it on the other. So maybe that could make the difference between activating somebody's hand or, or sensory input to the, to the hand and causing numbness but, um, uh, and, but still allow them to get the therapy that they need for the target that we're looking at. Um, so that's called current steering. So again, potential advantages avoid side effects. And even if it doesn't avoid side effects, you can imagine just intuitively, if you just turn on one of these segments rather than the whole segment, maybe I'm using less power. So maybe the battery will last a little bit longer. That's another positive, even if the therapy itself is, is still the same that's delivered. Um, and then this never happens at Yale because we have such a great surgeon, but 
sometimes the lead is not in the right place. And so you need a little bit of flexibility to turn that current around and away from the area that you don't want to stimulate and towards the area that you do. So rarely patients who have an improperly placed lead will need to have the, the lead uh, removed or readjusted. And so that's another surgery. If this can allow them to avoid that, that would be a great uh, advance. Um, there is another company that's looking at current steering in a different fashion. Rather than segment the lead, let's add just a bunch of contacts across that, that segment so that we can have a longer span and, and really have, have flexibility in a vertical plane rather than a lateral plane. So this is from Boston Scientific. Um, they have eight of those contacts on the, uh, on the segment, um, on the lead. And they have uh, what's called independent current control. So you can say, I want 70% of my current delivered to this part and nothing in the middle and the 30% at the bottom. So you can imagine that gives you, again, another avenue for flexibility to do the same kinds of um, um, interventions in terms of avoiding side effects from, let's say, this target that we don't want to stimulate. Again, decrease the power requirements. Maybe we don't need to activate the whole contact maybe uh, lead. Maybe we could just use a few contacts. And then again, troubleshoot improper leads. And anything that gives you more flexibility um, is, is a positive in the TBS world. Um, something like this could also be used, well, maybe I can try to get two targets instead of just one. Um, and that's a little bit further out, you know, things that we don't do commonly, but uh, that's the type of flexibility we can think of designing new therapies for in the future. Uh, because each target in the brain has a different quality and characteristic of what it's going to help you uh, in terms of your Parkinson's symptoms, or maybe even non-Parkinson's symptoms, as we'll talk about later. Um, you can see where this can go. Well, if I segment my lead and then if I add if I double the number, why don't I just have a, a whole lead that's, you know, 40 different little dots that I can turn on and off at, at whatever whim I want. And that's, uh, Medtronic has, has bought a company a few years ago that's working on that kind of a lead. Again, greater contact flexibility, greater ability to avoid side effects, uh, reduce power consumption or troubleshoot. Um, the challenge is, well, if you just have more options, is this just going to be more of a headache. Um, for, uh, we didn't have too many people who had DBS, but if you had it or know somebody who has, when you first come to the office to get programmed, it's a kind of a long visit where we test every contact. So all four of those co traditional contacts, and we say, where do you get benefit? Where do you get side effects? Let's pick the one that seems best for you. If I have 40 leads to go through, how, how long is that going to take me? Um, is there an algorithm that will guide me in using this? And so that's another part of this advance in the technology is we need better ways than just trial and error of programming. And one of the ways that, that uh, people are developing is to, to do anatomically guided programming. So in that operating room where you had the MRI, maybe we could take that picture of you, your personal picture, put it onto the tablet, and all of these companies are, have or are coming out with tablets that are very easy to use and interface with these, with these batteries. And the software will based on what you input in terms of the settings of the voltage and the pulse width, create a field that you can see. And it will put it up, up against the MRI that you had. So you can literally see, well, this is where I physically am stimulating, and this is where I am not. And so you could immediately start with, well, let me make a field that covers the entirety of the target I want. And so you've jumped ahead rather than just trial and error. You've gone to the, the most likely setting that that you need. Um, and so that could reduce the amount of time we spend programming the device. Again, reduce power consumption, because maybe you don't need to uh, make such a big field. Maybe you can make a smaller field, in fact. And then, of course, reduce side effects. Um, and part of this, this system, uh, or this, this thought process, is ultimately to maybe design a closed system. Right now, this is an open system. We, we program it, we see what you do, how you're walking, how your tremor is, how your stiffness is, and then we adjust it based on our impression of, of how well you're doing and, and what the settings are like. Well, what if we could take the neurologist out of the equation, that subjective quality? I mean, I'd still be there to supervise. Let's, you know, I would never contribute to a technology that got rid of me, right? But um, in theory, let's say we got rid of me. We can design a system. We can say, you know what, let's have a system that maybe looks at your tremor with a sensor, then inputs that to your battery and changes your therapy immediately based on your tremor. 
Or let's have another contact or a lead recording in the brain and looking for signals that represent Parkinson's. And then that gets fed back into your battery and that adjusts your stimulation on a day-to-day -day basis, a minute-to-minute -minute basis perhaps. And that's a closed system. It kind of takes the subjective nature of the programming out of it. Um, and it could really uh, make programming a lot more uh, concise or, or effective or tailored or personalized. Uh, Medtronic is working on one way of doing this called their PC plus S sensing uh, in addition to their typical uh, battery. And what that does is the traditional leads that everybody has tended to have from Medtronic have the ability to record, not just stimulate. Um, and so they can record uh, from that target in the brain. And this is a long uh, list of uh, jargon, but basically people have been looking at different recordings in Parkinson's patients. There seemed to be one common pattern of activity that people can record that says, you know what, this person's Parkinson's symptoms are going to be pretty high, or their tremor is going to be pretty high. And if you give dopamine, or if you turn on stimulation, you can see that pattern of electrical activity reduce. And now it translates into an improvement in their clinical symptoms. So the the device can be calibrated to look for that band of electrical activity and then compensate by changing its output to reduce that band. So it's, it's using that objective marker of brain activity to then change the stimulation. And in some of their early uh, research, it's been cut off a bit, but it seems to, in comparison to the standard model of seeing how somebody's doing and adjusting on your own based on your impressions as a, as a neurologist, improve motor scores by about 30%. Um, I would take that with a, a bit of a caveat, you know, these are small series. But even if it doesn't improve the standard therapy, they were able to reduce their battery consumption by about 50% in some of those studies. You could imagine uh, a stimulation that only comes on when you need it being more effective in, in reducing battery life. So that's an, a very interesting and, and um, a possible future advance that people are actively working on. Um, and again, I saw, I mentioned this earlier, uh, there are a number of ways that people are using wearable devices and how we integrate that into the DBS is, is an advance that, that we can look forward to. Um, uh, the challenges are uh, certainly um, uh, big, but this could definitely uh, increase the expansion of DBS to populations that may not be able to come into the office as often as we would like to make adjustments in the, in the first few months of, of DBS. You can imagine somebody you know, that you're Skyping with or FaceTiming with having a sensor and you talk about their symptoms and then you get a readout from their wearable watch that says, you know what, three hours out of the day they're having a lot of tremor, they're shuffling a lot, they seem to be off. Or, you know what, I gave them two programs on their device and I had them switch between the two. You know, the week they were on the first program was a lot better based on the, the device's output than the second one. And we don't always have to rely on subjective reports. Um, as you know, one of the challenges of Parkinson's is, uh, is sometimes knowing how well you are in any given moment. That day seems to be how you always are. And, and we kind of forget how we, maybe we were better the other day or worse the other day. It's hard to keep track. And so something objective that we don't have to rely on our own uh, memories or diaries is, is certainly another advance in DBS that could, could come across. I'm going to go away from Parkinson's disease a little and talk about things that are a little far afield. Um, again, people are expanding the use of DBS, um, and one of those areas is in Alzheimer's disease. And I bring this up not to say that this is uh, going to be a fix for Alzheimer's, but to say that uh, cognition, memory, attention, planning are areas that may be impacted or improved by DBS. Um, and we actually had uh, Andres Lozano uh, give grand rounds uh, at Yale the other day. And he uh, is a surgeon from the University of Toronto who's worked a lot on DBS in depression and in dementia, uh, who performed a study on six patients. And there was some publicity about it recently. So you may have seen this, this article, um, where they put a DBS electrode next to a part of the brain called the fornix, which, is, which communicates with our memory centers. And they tried to. Um, use stimulation to improve patients with Alzheimer's disease. And they had about six patients. Um, and when they looked at uh, the size of their memory centers, the hippocampus on MRI, two out of six of their uh, patients had a growth in their hippocampus size. Now, four out of six didn't, so it's a small study. Take it for what you will, but that's, that's pretty exciting for a condition that has no 
let's let's uh, be honest, real uh, real treatment in terms of quality of life and day to day. And some of the videos were dramatic. There was one, one video of a, a patient who, they put the electrode in, they turned it on, and she immediately started thinking of a memory. And she couldn't uh, recall exactly what it was, but she saw faces and a, and a house. And then they turn up the voltage, and she starts to remember a family vacation she took at the age of eight to Scotland. And he asked her, when was the last time you thought about it? And she said, oh, 50 years ago. And so definitely there is the ability to, to impact those pathways. Uh, it's very early days, and we don't know how to do that in any precision. But I think that's an, uh, a flavor of what could be possible with these types of technologies. Currently, mem memory disorders, major neurocognitive dysfunction, what we commonly call dementia, is a contraindication to DBS for Parkinson's patients. We know those patients with our traditional therapies don't do as well after the surgery and their thinking could get worse. And so we really counsel patients not to do that if they have it. So you can imagine if we could find a target or a therapy that would improve cognition, maybe we could again expand DBS to people who would not otherwise get it. The same goes for depression. Untreated depression and anxiety is a contraindication for some forms of DBS because we worry that some of the targets of the brain, when they're stimulated, could actually feed those, those difficulties. Um, and there's been a lot of efforts to use DBS to target an area of the brain called Broadman Area 25, a fancy term subcolossal cingulate uh, gyrus, um, for people with very severe depression. Um, so again, not exactly applicable to Parkinson's disease, but you can imagine if a therapy could more adequately treat PD, we could then expand the indication uh, to, to other patients more reliably. This, uh, was, uh, this uh, technique was studied in a, in a large clinical trial, large for DBS uh, patients, um, and in about, I think, 50 or so patients who are actually in the, completed the trial. And it was showing a, oops, a positive trend for improvement. However, at six months, the amount of benefit was not sufficient for the company to continue the trial. The FDA actually was okay with the trial continuing, um, but the company, for reasons that are not exactly clear, or at least public, uh, known to me, um, decided it wasn't something they wanted to continue with. However, as part of the study, they continued to track all of their patients. And at about two years, they were continuing to have positive effects from their stimulation. Uh, and these are really refractory depression patients, so people who have gone through medications, different therapies, and are really not getting any benefit. And a number of them at two years had had remission of depression. Not all of them, but certainly a higher percentage than the placebo group, which for that type of severe depression is, is pretty much almost unheard of. So I think it's, it's an area that's still being redefined, and I think people are developing newer techniques of, of screening patients with depression who might benefit from this. And, and it's done at very small centers. Actually, the person who pioneered this with Andreas Lozano was at the University of Toronto, then moved to Emory, and, and just in the last year or so uh, moved to Mount Sinai, where she's continuing her work. So um, it, it is an area that people are continuing to look at and may, again, expand the indication for DBS to other people, um, but it's still very early days. I'm going to move on away from DBS for a bit and talk about non-invasive uh, neuromodulation. So this is, these are techniques that don't require um, cutting or, or, or implanting hardware. One technology is, uh, that may be of use in Parkinson's is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a technology that uses magnetic fields to stimulate nerve cells. So here's an example of a, of a TMS. Uh, device placed on the scalp, and it has a very strong magnet that can then have an effect on the nerve cells just under the skull. Um, if you deliver a magnetic field to uh, conductive material, you will generate electrical impulses, uh, I think. I, it's been a while since I took ninth grade physics, but uh, that's pretty the, much the gist of it. Um, and it's been FDA approved as second line treatment for depression for a little while now, um, though its common adoption is not as perhaps widely known. Um, but you can imagine there might be some benefit to modulating the brain activity of Parkinson's patients in a non-invasive way. So one of the larger trials to do this was called the Master PD trial. It was funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Started about, 
oh, almost nine years ago now, um, and their data was published a couple of years ago. They had 50 patients with Parkinson's disease, and they gave them TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, in 30-minute sessions targeting the motor cortex. So that's the part of the brain just under the scalp that's responsible for our voluntary movements. They also targeted another area uh, responsible for depression uh, because a lot of these patients had depression as well. That was part of their screening criteria since we know that TMS does help depression a bit. And they gave uh, a number of patients real magnetic stimulation and a number of patients sham stimulation, so fake stimulation. And the group that got the sham never changed in their motor scores. But at six months, the group that had received the TMS sessions um, had a mild but very clear reduction in their UPDRS motor scores. Um, and so it was a mild improvement, but the, 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 the treatment and the risks of it were certainly low for them. It was non-invasive. And so any treatment that can kind of add to the overall improvement of motor scores without having much in the way of risk is certainly a positive uh, development. There have been about 20 studies, maybe close to 500 patients in various centers using TMS and different strategies. But what people can tell from these larger analyses of the smaller studies is that there's reasonable data to say that TMS to that area in the brain is probably effective in reducing the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. The real question is, um, because that benefit is probably mild, um, how long does that benefit last? How often do you have to get these treatments? What is the cost of the treatments? If it's going to be you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars each time you go in for a mild benefit, it's probably not great from a public health standpoint or even from a personal standpoint to be investing that much money in a treatment that's that mild. So still a lot of work to be done. But anything that can non-invasively uh, modulate the brain in a positive way is something we should be investigating further. Um, and this study. Uh, Michelle talked about rats. This, this was really interesting from last year that I think will have some implications in the future. It was a, with the caveat that it was done in rats. It's a very novel way of using that type of non-invasive technology to get not just at targets on the surface of the brain, but deeper, like the targets for Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, so what MIT researchers did was they took two high frequency signals. Now high frequency signals, the brain basically ignores. It's, it's too much. It's white noise. They don't, the nerve cells don't change in response to that. However, if you make these high frequency signals just a little different, when they meet each other, they will subtract and give you a low frequency signal deep down in the brain. And the brain will then change in response to that. It will turn on or turn off depending on the type of stimulation you're getting. So this is a way of affecting the activity of something deep in the, in the brain without having to cut or introduce an electrode in. Um, again, this was in rats. But you can see how this could have a really positive implication for Parkinson's patients. Even if this is not developed into a treatment, you can imagine as a diagnostic tool or as a you know, proof of concept therapy, this could be really interesting. Let's say you're a patient who is a borderline candidate for deep brain stimulation. You worry, is my speech going to get worse? Uh, is my balance OK? Do I, should I really do this procedure? You can imagine a, a technique like this giving you a non-invasive, perhaps temporary, effect that would mimic DBS and then say, you know what? Look at the benefit you had. Look at the side effects. DBS is right or not right for you from this type of a treatment. It's much more objective than our current assessments, which are a bit subjective, in which we have patients come in to the office, we examine them without having them taken any medications, then we give them their medications or even a higher than usual dose, and then we re-examine them. And if they have a big enough change, we tell them, eh, you're probably going to see an improvement in those symptoms that improve with the medication with the surgery, but for a longer period of time. So, and that's a, a fairly reliable way now, but this would be even one step further to see how you might behave with actually changing that, that part of your brain. So this is a bit Star Trek science fiction right now, but uh, again, an, an, a flavor of what hopefully we can do in the future. I'm going to move on to focused ultrasound now. And I put non-invasive and neuromodulation in quotes for reasons. We'll, we'll talk about why that's the case. But focused ultrasound has gotten a lot of uh, publicity in the last couple of years. It's been FDA approved now for the treatment of tremor, essential tremor, but has implications for Parkinson's disease that we'll talk about. Just a bit about the technology. It uses concentrated ultrasound waves to um, direct at a target. You can imagine 
Um, for example, if you have a magnifying glass, and we all did this as kids, right? We go out in the sun, we burn a hole in a leaf. That lens takes the light rays, concentrates them, and causes a heat on that, on that leaf and burns a hole. This does the same thing. It takes sound waves on this cap on the patient's head, concentrates them. So, and, and where those ultrasound waves meet generates heat and burns a tiny hole in the brain, right at the target where we think tremor is generated. Um, and each individual wave doesn't cause really problems at the surface of the brain. It's only where they meet that that uh, uh, effect is, is, is accomplished. And people have been doing this for a while, um, except before, in order to burn the hole in that part of the brain, you had to cut the scalp, cut the skull, introduce the electrode, get, generate heat at the tip of that electrode, and then take it out, actually what we were talking about earlier. And people had pretty much stopped doing this because DBS was developed. Um, so the reason I put non-invasive and neuromodulation in quotes is because it's not really non-invasive. I don't think anybody would argue that if you're burning a hole in your brain, that's pretty invasive. <laughs> what it is is non-incisional, right? You're not cutting, you're not putting hardware in. So that's an important caveat. And the marketing people for focused ultrasound certainly like saying non-invasive, it, but, it, but it's no small thing to, to undertake. Um, and it's also technically not neuromodulation, right? We're not actively adjusting or changing what the brain is doing, we're, we're causing a mechanical injury. But again, that technology can be used in a number of ways. If you use a less intense ultrasound wave, just under the threshold to burn the hole, you can actually affect the, the tissue uh, in a positive way. So just as I was saying before, you could target that area, see what clinical symptoms you get. Maybe your tremor goes away, and maybe you think, oh yes, this is a reasonable thing to do. Maybe I should get DBS in this area or maybe I should uh, go ahead with this procedure, um, or maybe I shouldn't because I'm getting side effects. Um, and it has a lot of a potential even outside of Parkinson's to be really interesting. Uh, you can imagine if people have uh, a certain part of their brain causing seizures, well, maybe we could do a surgery just using this technique rather than an open surgery. Or if they have a certain part of their brain generating bad signals for pain, maybe we could, we could temporarily or even permanently block that signal. Um, and again, from Andres Lozano's talk over this past week, if you use a not quite strong enough ultrasound wave, you can actually disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So one of the treatments of, uh, one of the barriers of treating uh, conditions of the central nervous system is that we have a very tight border between our blood and our brain, and only certain things get across. And that's great for, for our day-to-day -day lives, but not great when we want to get a treatment or a chemotherapy or a gene therapy from the blood to the brain. So what you can do is use ultrasound to temporarily disrupt the blood-brain barrier in only a particular spot of the brain. You can inject an intravenous treatment, and that treatment will go everywhere in the body, but it will only get into that one spot of the brain. And then in 24 hours, your brain will heal, and you will have targeted that therapy. So this technology is going to continue to expand in Parkinson's disease and, and without. Um, in terms of tremor and Parkinson's disease, it's, uh, I think, not quite something Parkinson's patients should really be too excited or too eager to undertake. Um, even for essential tremor, um, many respected uh, neurosurgeons, this is a, uh, an editorial from Ron Alterman at Beth Israel Deaconess, who said, you know what, you can only do this ultrasound procedure to treat tremor on one side of your body. If you do it on the second side, an unacceptable number of people have speech or balance problems. And so many people will only do it on one side. So if you can only do it on one side, why not do DBS when you can treat both sides? Um, there was a larger variability of the tremor response. Some people improved a lot. Some people didn't improve as much as they would have expected with DBS. So why you know, have that uncertainty? Um, a number of patients had side effects a year after the procedure. They had weakness in a hand or numbness or tingling in a hand. And because this is an injury, a burn injury, you can't go back and adjust it. Can't do it over, can't take it away. It's, it's a one size fits all. Um, and we don't know how long that benefit will last. We don't have five-year data. We don't have 10-year data. We know that tremor in Parkinson's disease is robustly controlled um, uh, throughout the life of the DPS. So um, uh, my colleagues and I wrote a kind of companion editorial as well where we said, yes, DBS is better. <laughs> we agree. Um, but we just need to study it more and see, see where that cost-benefit analysis 
uh, plays out. People are looking at it specifically for tremor and Parkinson's disease. In principle, there should be no difference in treating Parkinson's tremor or essential tremor with this type of technology. But again, it's, it's a unilateral, one-sided procedure. Um, people are going back. Another place that they used to commonly perform surgery for Parkinson's was in that globus pallidus. If you burn a hole there, you tend to improve the dyskinesias that people experience from taking their levodopa. So maybe they can go back and do that in the same fashion with ultrasound. Um, and an intrepid group of people in Spain even did a subthalamic nucleus um, uh, lesioning procedure with ultrasound. And I say they're intrepid because typically, if somebody has a stroke in this area, they actually have a dramatic hyper movement disorder where their arms and limbs on one side of their body could be flailing continuously. And so they performed these procedures and actually did show that they had a 50% improvement in a lot of these, in these group of 10 uh, UPDRS scores, their motor scores, and thankfully didn't have a lot of side effects. But uh, again, these were younger patients who had symptoms only on one side of their body. Um, and I think it's going to be hard to justify doing this type of procedure in the long run. So. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of work in this area for Parkinson's disease, but I think uh, we have to be a little skeptical of how game-changing it's going to be. It's nice to have another option, perhaps, for patients with a lot of tremor who can't have DBS for one reason or another. They, they have medical issues, they have uh, surgical issues, they can't go through anesthesia in that fashion. Um, this may expand the ways we can treat tremor or, or some symptoms like dyskinesia, but it's not going to be um, as dramatic as, as, as DBS advances, I think. And Again, we've been doing these procedures for a long time, actually. And there has been a non-invasive way of doing it for a while as well, using, rather than ultrasound waves, using gamma radiation. That's, that's actually, uh, if you've ever heard of, had the procedure done, or know somebody who's had gamma knife, uh, this is a way of using targeted radiation to treat tumors, um, fibroids, other types of things. And it was actually developed by a Swedish neurologist to do this procedure, thalamotomy, to treat tremor. Uh, and uh, rather than burning a hole, this delivers radiation that tells the, that part of the brain to die off in a controlled fashion gradually over the next three, four, five months. And as it dies off, you see that your tremor starts to go away. So focus ultrasound has gotten a lot of publicity, but we'll, we'll put it in the context of what it can help. And it's not the, the greatest technological advance. It's another option for us to deal with some of the, the symptoms like tremor that are related to Parkinson's. So take home messages. There are a number of different efforts underway to improve the delivery of deep brain stimulation. And I think that's realistic to expect in the next five years that the delivery of therapy will become more targeted or efficient uh, or just more pleasant, if not dramatically uh, different in its therapeutic delivery. From the patient's perspective, the real take home is still, is DBS right for me? And that's a, different, a bit of a different talk than we've had. We've assumed that it's right for, for everybody in these, in these kinds of conditions. But that's, that's really still the ultimate question. Is it right for me? Is it right for my symptoms? Is it right for my day-to-day uh, my, my -day life and my other medical issues? The exact sim you know, types of systems. Do I want one with segmented leads? Do I want one with large context? Do I need the traditional one? Do I need to have an MRI in the next week? These are all specific questions that you can kind of review with your uh, neurologist or neurosurgeon. But, um, they're secondary to the fundamental question of should I have surgery or not. And finally, non-invasive options are not quite ready, but people are looking in, in a lot of different avenues to try to change the brain in a way that's not as invasive or, or taxing on, on the body. All right. So that's my spiel. I'll take any questions if you need it. My first comment is that I don't know if you've seen my video, but if I turn these suckers off, I can't function. There's nobody in this room today right now that shakes like I, shakes like I was shaking. I couldn't even stand here. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'm going to go to sleep while you're having the surgery. They can tell me a million times, but I don't buy it. Because I think if, if I'm to be awake and they can see it, see me stop shaking, they know they have the right spot. It's if they can't tell that, but they can't, they can't know. Like I said, the, it would be the second time I studied both sides. The second one, they had to move the lead four times during surgery. 
they're going to stick with it because it's a half hour each time and light it with that thing on your head. And so, if they had put it all in double up, it was the first time, it couldn't have been as good. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like, 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 it's like,
Um, it's not for people who take their medication, or who've had Parkinson's for 20 years, they say they take their medication and it doesn't work. Positive response to levodopa is one of the positive predictors that you're gonna do well with DBS. Yeah. I think it's certainly when you're diagnosed, it's nice to know all of the different options. Certainly you don't wanna fixate on it, you're, you're too good for that. Um, for an elective brain procedure to have for, to treat mild symptoms, but knowing that if things change, um, I have options, and and these are the steps I should I should go through before I get to certain options is nice to know, because I I never like to see and I tell other physicians if they're referring to our center for surgery, you know, refer them earlier. We can have the discussion, and I'll tell them it's not right for you right now, um, but it's better that they know about it so they can plan if the time comes, because I, I never like to see patients who have said, you know, I've been dealing with these ups and downs for two years, three years, four years, and I think you should have had surgery two years ago. You'd have had two years with really good symptom control, I think. Um, and so there's, there's a balance between not doing it too early and not waiting too long. What's the percentage of people who get DBS who don't improve at all? It's very low. It's, it's a variety. Um, it's who don't improve at all, single digits. Because it's such a multi-center, hodgepodge type of group of patients, um, and that number has been going down over the course of the therapy, because we know how to better screen people now than we did 25 years ago, um, uh, that, that number has gone down. Um, it still happens every once in a while. The first thing to do in that case is not think that therapy has been wrong, but that something is in the wrong place or you have the wrong settings. And so that's what the programming part about is. In it. But if you're responding to levodopa and you have typical Parkinson's disease, you're gonna get better with DBS, knowing nothing else about your case. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go next door just and I'll come back to you. <laughs> There's no age cutoff, technically, but we do know that older patients don't respond quite as robustly as younger patients. So that's a little bit tied to your question, which is where we, will, we know that there's, and young in the DBS world is a little different from in the general Parkinson's disease world. A lot of these studies differentiate between people younger than 65 and over 65, certainly 70 and older. We start to think, well, if you're over 70, sometimes you don't have quite as robust a response as we'd like. Um, that's not to say people don't benefit, it's just not quite as life-changing as it is for younger patients. There's something about the younger brain that is a bit more plastic. Um, but with the same standardized assessments, there's no age cutoff, and we have implanted people who are 79, 80, 81, again, with individualized treatments, and it's not for everybody, but there's no absolute age cutoff. I'll give it back to you. Does um, DBS help balance issues with more of It does not. So it's a, that's one of the challenges. People who are falling a lot may not be a good candidate for DBS. I tend to th tell people uh, the symptoms in the middle of our body, which are probably the most challenging for levodopa as well, uh, are also challenging for DBS. So people with a lot of speech problems, a lot of balance and fall problems, probably not the best candidate for DBS. There was a question. <laughs> I do not. I like acupuncture. I think it's a good therapy in general for Parkinson's. Um, some of the perhaps non-motor or pain symptoms a lot of the time. I don't have great uh, data or personal experience with how it's used. I think it's low risk, certainly. targeted probiotics for individuals? I'm not. Um, I, I agree. I think it definitely has a role. I just don't know that we know exactly how to modify it reliably. So I tell people to eat yogurt and, you know, exactly. All the things I don't do in my daily life, I tell my patients, <laughs> eat whole foods, vegetables, exercise regularly. Problems and freezing, but no tremors yeah, so that's kind of part of the question about balance. If people are freezing a lot, we tend to think they're not the best candidate for DBS. There are some caveats to that. If somebody freezes purely when their levodopa runs out, 
And if we take a look at the whole patient, we can, that, that might respond. Though in the back of our minds, we do counsel patients, you know, this is something to look out for that uh, may be a challenge down the road, even if it responds in the short term to DBS. But um, freezing of gait is one of those kind of red flags in the DBS process. And what about like, just movement in general? Overall bradykinesia, slowness of movements does tend to improve with DBS as well. Again, the best predictor is often how do you feel with your levodopa working at its best? And if you can tell what gets better with levodopa, that's going to get better with the DBS. But now it's going to be continuous throughout the day rather than the ups and downs of the pills. You're going to yep. Yep. I'll be here. Doug's going to stay around after, after the last next week. We're going to go to uh, food for now. We have 45 minutes, and you can see the vendors in the back. You can go speak to Dr. Valley or Dr. Patel. I'm certainly here. Right yeah. and, we'll, and we'll be back. We'll have another speaker. And we'll, then the doctors will stay here for all your questions. I have another comment about that, though, while I remember. Um, if you stay in shape, they'll give you the surgery. If you're not, if you go in there and you can be 55, if you're really lousy in shape, in your heart, they're not going to let you have surgery. Because I'm 70, and I just had my third replacement. So, 11:45, we're back. Food is down there. Thank you very much. About the good food, but we picked out good food. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Excellent. Our next valued speaker is Dr. Sarah Buckingham. She specializes in neurology and movement disorders at Stanford Health Medical Group. Dr. Buckingham is going to talk to us about how to be your own advocate. And um, in addition, she received her me medical degree from Sidney Kimmel Medical College. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. All right. Let's adjust this. Can everyone hear me okay? A little bit. I know my voice is soft. Is this better? Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, so I practice in Stanford at the uh, Stanford Health Medical Group associated with the hospital. Um, and today I'll be talking about how to be your own advocate in Parkinson's. So earlier today you heard about treatments, medication, surgery, um, and this is sort of a complement to that. So everything else that you should know once you're actually diagnosed with the disease. So we'll <clears throat> review some quick facts about Parkinson's, the diagnosis, and then once you are diagnosed, what are the next steps? Uh, we'll review what is a movement disorders neurologist, um, educational resources, any sort of lifestyle changes that can be helpful, exercise, types of therapy, can't quite see the bottom, but community resources, community events, support groups, that sort of information, and then research. Um, so Parkinson's <clears throat> is the third most common neurological disease. Um, in the U.S. there are about 60, at least 60,000 new cases diagnosed annually. There are around a million people in the U.S. who live with Parkinson's and about 10 million worldwide. Um, the risk of developing Parkinson's increases as you age. It is more common in men um, and only a small percentage are genetic. Um, so how is it diagnosed? So just briefly, it still remains a clinical diagnosis, meaning it depends on the symptoms that the patient is experiencing, what family members are observing, and then the um, neurological or movement disorders exam that we perform. Um, in some cases, it is useful to get uh, brain imaging, but not in everyone. So MRI of the brain can be useful, um, and then something called a DAT scan or a dopamine scan can also be useful in some cases. So. Once, once you are diagnosed, what are the, what are the next steps? What, sh what should you do? So the first step really is to really confirm the diagnosis. So if it wasn't made by 
a movement disorders neurologist, you should find one. Um, so a lot of people, um, you know, are told they have Parkinson's by a primary care doctor, a uh, general neurologist, uh, maybe even a, a different type of physician. And really, you just want to make sure that that really is what you have. You know, there are certain conditions that mimic Parkinson's. There's different types of Parkinson's. Um, so it's important to just know from the beginning just to be sure that, you know, that is the correct diagnosis. Um, so a movement disorder neurologist is a neurologist who has subspecialty training, so additional training. Um, so we do four years of general neurology, um, which includes really all types of neurological diseases and disorders. And then we move on to, um, you know, at least one to two years of what's called fellowship training, which is subspecialty training. Um, and we'll sort of review what sort of diseases we see in that, in that part of our training. Um, the website, Partners in Parkinson's, ha actually has a tool where you, where you can enter uh, your address or zip code, and it'll actually provide you with a list of movement disorder specialists that are near you. So that's helpful. Um, so within this one to two years of additional training, really the only types of patients we see are patients who have movement disorder. So Parkinson's is by far the most common. Um, so it's really just one to two years of seeing a lot of Parkinson's patients. Um, there are other types of movement disorders that are listed here. Does this work? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so all types of tremors. So there's a you know, essential tremor or benign tremor. And then there's a lot of other types of tremors that we see. Dystonia, you can kind of read through the list here. Chorea, myoclonus, oops, uh, tics, um, ataxia, restless leg syndrome, et cetera. Um, so that's just to get a flavor of what sort of patients we see in, during this time of ad additional training. Um, and you know, aside from confirming the diagnosis, what are some other advantages of seeing a movement disorder neurologist, so someone who can really manage your Parkinson's? Um, it really comes down to expertise in medications and, and the surgery piece. Um, there are, as most of you know here, a lot of medications to use in Parkinson's, and unless you really have a, a lot of training using the medications, knowing which combinations are helpful, um, you know, it's better for the patient uh, really to to be with someone who, who is more familiar with them. Um, surgical management, DBS management and programming, uh, Duopa, so the pump, um, so management and titration of that, uh, Botox injections if needed, so some patients with Parkinson's uh, are benefited by Botox injections, both for dystonia, sometimes for drooling, um, so that's also helpful. Um, and then someone, again, who's just sort of up to date on the literature, the research, et cetera. Um, so I always like to tell patients to, to read up on Parkinson's. Um, you know, certainly you can Google it and you can find tons of information, sometimes true, sometimes false. Um, but these three websites are really great um, resources uh, for patients, and it just really gives you a lot of information that's easy to read um, on all different aspects of Parkinson's. The physical symptoms, some of the non-motor symptoms, you know, constipation, lightheadedness, any cognitive uh, changes, you really can, can read a lot about uh, all of those things on these websites. It also g keeps you up to date with any news that's coming out, any new medications, et cetera. Um, so, a, as was probably alluded to earlier, I mean, there's obviously no cure for Parkinson's. Most of the medications we use are just for symptoms. Um, and as I'll touch upon a little bit uh, later on as well, aerobic exercise is very, very important, almost as important um, as medications are, um, because it, it can slow the disease down. So what are some lifestyle changes um, that might be helpful? Um, again, aerobic exercise, which we'll continue to uh, touch upon. Um, there's really no one specific diet that's been shown to be helpful um, in Parkinson's. Certainly, as with most people, eating a balanced diet, um, making sure you do consume at least some amount of fiber, because as we know, constipation is common, um, drinking a lot of water, especially as the, as the weather warms up. Um, Patients with Parkinson's are prone to being lightheaded, so just making sure that you're always staying hydrated. Um, sleeping is, is you know, very important. 
um, really for everyone, but certainly in patients with Parkinson's. A lot of times patients with Parkinson's have some sort of, do you hear that beeping? Yes, yes what is that? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, patients with Parkinson's can have, you know, abnormal sleep cycles. They can have uh, certain types of sleep disorders. Um, and I've had, you know, many patients tell me that if they really didn't get a good night's sleep, they know that that next day is going to be a bad day. Um, so really trying to optimize the sleep as much as possible. Um, certainly reducing stress, which again is nice for everyone, um, sometimes difficult to do. Um, but that can certainly make symptoms worse. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure what that is from. I don't know. It's like when I get close to it. Um, <clears throat> getting the flu shot. So most patients with Parkinson's, if they get sick from something else, meaning a cold or a flu or urinary tract infection, whatever it might be, for most people, it does make the Parkinson's temporarily worse. So really trying to do anything you can to avoid, you know, those sorts of scenarios. So getting the flu shot, making sure you have a primary care doctor that you see regularly, um, <clears throat> and just try, you know, really trying to stay as healthy as possible. Um, again, aerobic exercise, very important. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of studies and a lot of evidence showing that it can slow the disease down. Um, it's been shown to help the brain use dopamine more efficiently, um, help the brain grow new dopamine receptors. Um, in addition, it improves mood, um, it can improve energy level, improve sleep. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, and I really, I try to emphasize it a lot with patients that it really is almost as important as, as the medications. Um, so what is aerobic exercise? So we're not just talking about getting out and walking around, strolling around. I mean, certainly it's always good to keep moving, but aerobic exercise specifically means exercise that increases your heart rate. Um, so it really can be anything you like to do. Um, brisk walking, jogging, um, biking, either recumbent bike, stationary bike, um, the elliptical, rowing, stair climber, swimming, really anything that you like to do that increases your heart rate. Um, and a lot of people just aren't in the practice of exercising, which is very common. Um, and another issue sometimes is people have orthopedic issues, right, like knee, knee pain, uh, knee problems, back problems that can sometimes limit exercise. But as much as you can, try to at least get into a routine um, of doing aerobic exercise. I usually tell patients to start exercising just 10 minutes a day, that's it, just to get into the habit of doing some sort of um, aerobic workout. Um, and then the last bullet on the bottom there says find a um, Parkinson's exercise class. Um, so nationwide and even, uh, even internationally there are specific activities and programs that have develop, been developed just for the Parkinson's population. Um, so one example is rock steady boxing, which maybe some of you participate in. Um, and it's helpful for balance, for coordination. There's even a, um, a speech component, so it can be helpful for the voice as well. Um, and these are just some examples of the locations. If you just Google rock steady boxing, it'll you know, tell you where the locations are. Um, there's other boxing classes for Parkinson's that aren't, you know, rock steady specifically. Um, I have a few patients who go to the Westport class. Um, <clears throat> dance for PD, so that is also a really great um, option. And again, it's working a lot on coordination, um, hand-eye coordination, you know, brain-limb coordination. Um, there's a lot of different locations for that as well. Actually, one here in Branford, it looks like. I don't know if anyone participates in that, um, but most people do really love it. So there's these sorts of programs that are more specific for the Parkinson's population um, that, you know, if you like to do something like that, if you find it easier to have an actual scheduled class that, that you know, forces you to, to exercise, that can be helpful. Um, so therapy. So... We're talking physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. So again, there's a specific 
program or a specific method of therapy um, that was originally developed as a speech therapy method, um, the LSVT, which is Lee Silverman voice technique um, or voice therapy. And it's been expanded to include physical therapy. So most patients with Parkinson's do need some physical therapy at some point, um, and it's really the most efficient and the most effective if you can find um, a therapist who is licensed or certified um, uh, through LSVT, so to really use those specific techniques. Um, on that website there, you can um, actually just enter your zip code and it'll provide you with a list of um, you know, PTOT speech that are certified um, in LSVT. Um, there's also a type of physical therapy I learned about recently from a patient. It's called Parkinson's Wellness Recovery, which apparently is supposed to um, piggyback onto the LSVT. So you complete that LSVT program, and then uh, this type of therapy you can participate in subsequently. So that's available in, in some locations too. Support groups. So, you know, support groups are not for everyone. There's certainly pros and cons. Um, it also depends on the type of support group. So some, you know, some support groups have, tend to have more older people versus younger people, more advanced um, versus early on. Sometimes it's a mixture. Um, you know, some patients who are sort of on the mild end of the spectrum maybe don't prefer to go to support groups because then they see patients who are advanced and they get worried that that's, you know, where they're headed. So there, there are definitely pros and cons. Um, you know, support groups are located um, many, many locations. These are just some of the locations. Um, you know, I, I'm down in Stanford, so <clears throat> I sent my patients to the support group in New Canaan, uh, which actually started as a young onset group. So it's now expanded to include everyone, but it does actually have quite a few members who are young onset, still working full time. Um, so that's sort of a different type of mixture. Um, the DBS support group uh, meets at Yale second Tuesday of the month. I think that's still accurate. Good. Um, which is also helpful too. Um, so what kind of community events? Um, you know, the website, the APDA website is, um, it's American Parkinson's Disease Association. The Connecticut chapter website really does list a lot of the um, events, even exercise classes, support groups. Um, which is helpful. The Connecticut Optimism Walk um, is in Westport every year. It's in October. There's a Northern Connecticut uh, Walk, which is in Simsbury, also in October. Um, the very, very large, uh, great event that happens in uh, Central Park every year, the Unity Walk, that's in April. I don't know if anyone's ever been to that. It's I've never been, actually, but it's supposed to be, yeah, really great, really great. Um, and then the, uh, the CAP, the Connecticut Advocates for Parkinson's, they certainly, um, you know, have events themselves and also, you know, not notify and, um, you know, let everyone know about other events that are happening around the area. Um, research. So research, again, just like support groups, not for everyone. Um, some people just aren't interested in it. Um, I'd, I'd say the most helpful tool is really the Fox Trial Finder. So this is on the Michael J. Fox website. And I'm not sure if probably some of you are, are um, linked into that. But you really just enter your information, and it matches you with, uh, with clinical trials that you, um, that you qualify for in your area. So you get to see you know, what, what's out there and what's available. Um, Clinicaltrials.gov is a comprehensive database of all the active and upcoming um, and even completed clinical trials. It's a little dense, but you can certainly always search through that too to see, um, see what the options are. Um, okay, so, you know, in addition to medications and surgery, surgical options, um, you know, there, there are a lot of other factors to also think about and um, that can really help with your symptoms. Um, a lot of patients, certainly when you, when you first receive the diagnosis, you know, it's, it is life-changing. Um, even if you're expecting to hear that's what you had, um, you know, certainly 
changes your life. Um, it's a disease that you live with forever, unfortunately. Um, and what I try to tell people is, you know, there's sort of two ways to go. Um, you can kind of let the disease dictate your life, or you can be the one who dictates the disease and has control over the, the disease. Um, so a lot of these kind of points I talked about today, I feel like those are most helpful for patients to feel like they're in control because it's something you do for yourself, right? So starting an exercise routine, changing your lifestyle, you know, being part of a support group, being part of research, whatever it might be, it's a way that, you know, you feel like you're, you're doing it for yourself as opposed to us, you know, offering you medication. So, you know, the goal is really to find a movement disorder specialist that you really like and that you can form a partnership with. Um, and it's sort of a two-way street. Um, it is helpful to ed educate yourself, to know the vocabulary, to really be kind of honed in on your symptoms and you know how much they really affect your life. Um, and again, the exercise is really important. Um, and then if you know when you do take a medication, making sure that you know you try as much as you can to stick to the schedule, um, you know, report any problems, um, you know, keep your doctor up to date. Sometimes patients, you know, will start a medication and they come back four months later and they say, oh, I stopped it after the first week. And it's like, oh, well, you should have just call, like, let me know. Um, <laughs> you know, always just try to remember that it is a partnership and we do things um, to try to help you, but there's definitely a lot that you can really do for yourself um, to make it, you know, make it feel like you're really in control of the disease. Um, and then, you know, like I went through, there's a lot of events, a lot of resources that are in the community. Um, and most of it you can find online if you just, you know, Google it. But that is also a way that you can, you know, feel connected to other people who share, you know, your symptoms and, um, you know, share your journey. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> Two miles in the road race, raise money for Parkinson's disease for CAP to come to that event. So. In your, in your talk, you mentioned the importance of aerobic physical exercise. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on mental exercises? For example, crossword puzzles, jumbles, and along that line. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, it's 
it's important to have um, some sort of structure to your day, meaning you go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, take your medications on time. But I do tell patients that within that, especially for the mental, um, the cognitive piece, you should try to vary what you do. Um, so getting out and socializing is one aspect, but also doing activities for your mind that are more active rather than passive. Um, so exactly what you're saying. Any sort of word puzzles, word games, crosswords, um, even if you do it, you know, 20 minutes a day, it's something that's a little bit different um, that stimula stimulates your mind. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Can we have all, Dr. Patel and Dr. Degasi, could you, why don't you all come up and we'll do the three, the question and answer. To, if you want to ask any question you want of all three doctors. I did just want to let everyone know for upcoming events, um, Medtronic is actually sponsoring a nice talk um, in Danbury on July 21st. Um, Solomon, what time do we start? 9 a.m.? I think we start at 9 a.m. It'll be another some 9 a.m. We'll be, I'll be speaking with some more Parkinson's updates, and Cynthia Barr will be giving an update on um, exercise and rehab, so that'll be really nice. Um, I'm also on the board of the American Parkinson's Disease Association Connecticut chapter, and as Dr. Buckingham alluded to, we have a very nice website. We also have a site up on Facebook. If you want to like us and then follow us, and you can find out all the events that we're sponsoring. Um, we do a lot of great fundraising, and our aim is to provide a lot of community outreach and free classes for the Parkinson's community. We're always looking for new members to come and help support us and for ideas of what the community needs. So let your voices be heard. It's uh, the APDA Connecticut chapter. Oh. Yep. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're new to Parkinson's and we're learning a lot about the symptoms and things that we didn't realize were related to Parkinson's. And I'm wondering, is there a way or a method of, tra you mentioned tracking the symptoms. Is there an app? Is there a journal? Is there a specific list even of, of potential symptoms to, to be looking for in tracking? Um, as, as far as I know, there's no app. Do we know of any? No. Or do uh, not specifically. I. Th I want to say there, I've seen a couple of bad apps yes. that uh, yes. people have, have shown me, which I've immediately forgotten about, so I can't tell you what they are. Um, but, but no, I don't, I don't think there's a reliable app that I've seen that, that I think is worthwhile mm -hmm. to adopt. Um, I mean, I usually just recommend, you know, not to be too focused on it, because it can certainly make people anxious. Um, but to just be aware of, I mean, the most common, I would say, are constipation is very common, um, dizziness, any sort of sleep problems, um, fatigue can also be common. Um, I mean, those are sort of the bigger ones, but it, it really could be quite a variety. But just, if anything's really prominent, just making sure you bring it up um, during the appointment. There's definitely yeah, a balance between um, obsessing too much over right. symptoms and then ignoring them. There's a balance between the two, and mm -hmm. it's hard to know for every one patient. Sometimes it's best to uh, take a three or four day span, you know, sometimes even maybe a couple weeks before your next appointment with your neurologist and say, I'm going to really keep track of my movement my, in relation to my timing of medication, how much sleep I'm getting when I eat my meals. And that way you can review that with the neurologist at the appointment and you can see if there are any patterns to how you're feeling during the day based on your other lifestyle. So that's, that's maybe one, mm -hmm. one you know, way to approach that. Whereas the rest of the time in between your appointments, you're just you know, living your life and, and doing what you want to do. And I think that actually speaks to Dr. Buckingham's point why it's important to see a movement disorder specialist. So there are questions that we're going to ask you at your appointments that other people are not. You know, so whether or not we do a comprehensive, you know, Movement Disorder Society, MDS, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, UPDRS, right? So there are components of that that we work into our visit that ask you about, you know, motivation, your mood, your sleep. Can you roll over in bed? Are you cutting things with your fork? Are you having anxiety? So there is a whole set of bullet points that we sort of go through systematically either in our own heads or prompted through our electronic health records, you know, we move through, that we ask you that are considered standards of care in a movement disorder visit that you will not get other places. So while it, it is important to educate yourself, a lot of that you're going to sort of, that will be teased out by your doctor. 
And I would say also that uh, patients or, or other physicians sometimes have the same um, uh, bias. They either ascribe everything to Parkinson's or nothing to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And so it's always a good idea to run it by somebody who sees a lot of Parkinson's patients. Because there, there's a wide range of, of symptoms, as you said. So in every visit, we can't exactly counsel you to every possible symptom because it may not apply to you and it may not be at your right stage of illness, but given the right circumstances, could be applicable. So you know, I've had patients who call me about, well, I didn't tell you about my constipation because I didn't think it was related, even though we go over it every visit. And, uh, or alternatively, you know, <laughs> the first call after you, know, you have chest pain is not to your neurologist. <laughs> so, you know, there's a balance between the two. I was just wondering, I used to actually, I'm a nurse, former nurse, and I used to um, teach cardiac rehab. So I'm wondering if there was any place for this Parkinson's group to be part of a, a cardiac rehab program. They certainly are the people that are the best in knowing about aerobic therapy. Um, to start coupling Parkinson's with the cardiac rehabs because there is no specific aerobic program for the Parkinson's patients. Is that correct? I mean, you just mentioned 10 minutes. That's not going to raise your heart rate and give you a warm up and cool down. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll say that. You know, I certainly have a lot of patients who have personal trainers, let's say, that, you know, together they've developed some sort of program that includes aerobic exercise. Um, you know, the physical therapy that's done. Uh, you know, occasionally, if you're not actually participating in the, you know, formal LSVT program, which is four days a week um, for a month, if you're not in that, but you're still working with an LSVT physical therapist, let's say twice a week, often they will incorporate some sort of aerobic exercise, like use the bike for 15 minutes or something like that. Um, I mean, not all patients can participate in aerobic exercise that's like 30 minutes in length. Um, you know, like I said, depending on age, depending on orthopedic issues, uh, respiratory issues, et cetera. Um, but, you know, you're right. There's no actual, like, aerobic exercise that we can write a prescription for. That's true. Um, yeah, I will say, though, LSVT, for those of you who have done it, will give you a workout. It will get your heart rate up. And if you look mm -hmm. at the data, they have compared, you know, the low intensity, the low to moderate intensity, and the high intensity um, aerobic exercise combined with stretching and some resistance in Parkinson's patients. And actually, the low to moderate intensity group bested both, meaning that you should be able to have a conversation during your exercise, although you do need to elevate the heart rate. Um, there's additional data looking at high intensity intervals, although I would say for the most part, most patients are not able to do 20 seconds of their utmost high intensity with only a 20 second reprieve. And that's really what those studies were looking at. So I think it's always beneficial to get in, you know, get in that exercise. But um, you know, we just want people to start. So 10 minutes isn't going to change your world, but 10 minutes today, maybe 20 minutes next month. Hi. My name is Steve DeWitt. I just wanted to extend thanks first to the, the doctors for being here for the, the presentation. Could everybody help me thank our, our, our guests, that, our doctors that are with us today? Thank you very much for being here. I also wanted to make a thank you with the following question to it for our vendors that are here. I call them vendors, but they're really partners. We've, we've been really lucky to have these kind of folks involved with the programs. They're giving up their Saturday to be part of the education process. They're not here selling, they're really here to help us understand what they have to offer. But from that, there is a question, because sometimes relationships can become strained, or we, some of the questions can become more difficult as we try to work on lower medication costs and, and some other challenges that are related to research. And there's a product that, that was recently challenged by CNN called New, New Plus, I believe it is, and Dr. D, D, Dr. Michelle. If you would speak to the CNN report and maybe give us some insight into how, uh, how that came about and whether that medication is, has something that we, to be concerned with. This is a hallucinatory medication that's out in the marketplace. Yeah, so, um, so what Steve is talking about, um, and I think he asked me to talk about this because I, we were involved in all the pivotal trials um, for this drug, so New Plazid. Um, and I mentioned this in my talk sort of briefly, how this is a medication that works on Parkinson's psychosis, right? So seeing things, typically seeing things that are not there while you're wide awake as it relates to your Parkinson's disease. And historically in the past, the way that these were treated were by lowering the dosages of your dopaminergic medications, such as your levodopa, your dopamine agonist, 
antagonists, um, or introducing medication to block your dopamine receptors, which I had sort of mentioned in my talk. So Nuplazid, or Pimavinsarin, has been out now for several years and has extensive data. I think I have a, a patient who had been on it in trial for almost 20 years at this point. Um, and it, so CNN came out with this article a couple months back with a concern, the sort of watchdog group, that perhaps that there were, um, this drug was actually killing patients. I will say that, um, in my opinion, and I'm not a speaker for New Plaza, I have no vested interest, I think it was really irresponsible reporting. So for example, if you look at the class of medications that we use to treat Parkinson's-related psychosis, our hands are sort of tied as your doctor, right? We want to give you the best quality of life. We don't want you hallucinating. We know that hallucinations that are left untreated actually get worse over time. They ramp up. They can be disturbing. They can make people very agitated, and they can be a very large reason why people are having to leave their homes and go into a nursing home or have an emergency room visit, which we would all like to avoid, right? So we try and do no harm. The whole class of medication, so every single one of them that we have available to use has a black box warning. A black box warning is something that the FDA puts on a medication when there are deaths that are related to the medication. So any antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication on the market today will have a black box warning for an increased risk of suicide. And these atypical antipsychotics and the typical antipsychotics that block your dopamine receptors will carry a similar warning that there may be death related to the use of these products. Again, this is a class warning, not individual. So the CNN article sort of implied that Nuplazid as compared to other medications was causing more deaths um, in our patient population. If you actually look at the data um, out, of a, out of the patients treated with Parkinson's related psychosis, there was about a, I want to say about a 14% um, reported death rate with Nuplazid, but in the untreated category, the percentage rate was about 28%. So remember I told you earlier, you can make data say anything you want. So you've got to be very careful. You could take that data and say new plazid, you know, causes a 50% reduction in death. I don't think that that would be accurate, right? I don't think that that would be fair. That's not, it's not been studied that way. So I think what ended up happening was that you had a group with probably some pretty good intentions looking to make sure that patients weren't being taken advantage of and that people had full facts and information. But unfortunately, I do find that this was irresponsible reporting and, and it really sent up these red flags for people thinking that, oh my goodness, if I'm on this medication, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. And I had a patient call sobbing. I don't wanna die, I've got grandchildren. I, you know, I gotta come off this medication. It was terrible. It was really quite awful. Now listen, this isn't the medication for everybody. None of it is. Hippocrates himself said the only difference between a, you know, a treatment and a poison is the dosage. We've gotta be careful. We've gotta be responsible. You have to work as a team. As Dr. Buckingham said, you do have to educate yourself. So to speak to Steve's point, I think there was a lot of concern in the patient population because people thought, oh my God, I, I, I have to come off this drug, I'm gonna die. And again, that's not, that's not necessarily true. Patients who have advanced Parkinson's disease who are hallucinating, right? So they're, they tend to be older. They tend to have other comorbidities, meaning that they might have heart disease, they might have lung disease, kidney disease, diabetes. It's a fragile population of people. And so I think we have to work as a team on an individualized basis and look at your risks, look at the benefits, and see what makes the most sense. But I don't want anyone to be, in my opinion, and I'll open this up to you guys in just a second, um, you know, I don't think anyone should be terrified. If you are working with a doctor who you trust and they think that this is the right drug for you or a family member, I think you should have an open conversation about it. But, um, you know, to my mind, there's no additional concerns. And the FDA has actually put out repeated statements saying that they are not, they don't have additional concerns about this drug that they, you know, that are new, they follow it, they track it, where, you know, there are all these, the stage four, um, you know, clinical trials where they're continuing to collect safety data, so obviously everyone's watching it, but there's no new concerns about this drug. I don't know if you guys want to weigh in on that. Does that relate also to nightmares? Is it nightmares? So the question, you know, does it relate to vivid dreams? And the answer is really no. These are two separate issues, and patients often confuse them. They can be difficult. 
So in Parkinson's, with the changes in your sleep architecture and your sleep patterns, Parkinson's patients can have these very vivid dreams that are difficult to differentiate from actual reality sometimes. They can have periodic limb movements of sleep, the jimmy legs. You can have the REM behavior disorder where you're talking in your sleep or acting out your dreams. Those parasomnias are present in about 80% of Parkinson's patients. Um, and these are different from seeing things that are not there while you're wide awake. I jump out of bed at night and fall down. I have to sleep on the floor. I'm going to have to tell Dr. Machado to talk he to you. He knows that. He, <laughs> I take Clonopin, by the way. Yeah. You should stop doing that, Ray. It's, I know, it's I know. not advised. <laughs> no, I was just in life. Uh, one of several of us are from uh, uh, a group called Delay the Disease, which you may be aware of. We're uh, from the YMCA at uh, Westbrook which is every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 o'clock for an hour. So it's a regular program, very inexpensive. And it's a national program. I think it came originally out of Ohio. Delay the disease. Did you guys want to weigh in on the new class? Um, yeah. Earlier, uh, uh, Dr. Patel, uh, you were speaking about the uh, differences with the awake DBS on the sleep, and mm -hmm. Ray made his point that you couldn't talk him into the sleep yeah. one. My question is, with the sleep one, what are you seeing with the deeper general anesthesia and the, it, the a risk that has yeah. already in the population It's a good question. That? Yeah. So um, if you look at the, lar the large series that have been reported, um, or the multiple smaller series that have been collated together, um, the risks and side effects of, the, of the, um, the asleep procedure seem about the same as the awake procedure. But I think in our personal uh, experience, every once in a while a patient will take a little bit longer to recover from the fully asleep uh, procedure because of the deeper level of anesthesia. So that first procedure which the, in which the electrode is placed typically has a one night over, overnight stay. Um, in the hospital. Um, every once in a while, not everybody, but every once in a while, perhaps an older patient who's getting DBS will need a second night because they're just a little bit foggy, a little bit off balance. Um, so that is one thing we're noting anecdotally um, at our center. I don't know that it's been borne out nationally, um, uh, but uh, that's one thing to be aware of. I don't think it's, um, and again, often patients who um, uh, who might be more susceptible to the anesthesia are also the same ones who, who really need the anesthesia to go through the surgery because they may have um, other medical issues which require a more direct control of the airway and that's what general anesthesia allows you to do. Um, so that may be a reason that there we're self-selecting people who we you know, would have uh, been a little bit nervous doing it awake, but now feel more confident. And because naturally, they would have also had some difficulty clearing from the anesthesia. So it may not be specific to the procedure, but it is something to, to be aware of. It is true. Yeah. I got a comment on that, too. You know, we have oh, constipation, a lot of us do anyway. And those opioids, they tend to uh, add to that problem. That caused me to have to stay a second night my first time in. Second time I said, no, no, don't let me push the button because I don't want to have to stay another night. So it's, it's it was <laughs> two extra nights, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting? There. Who's counting? She was there. <laughs> Hi, although it's on the Eastern spectrum, I was wondering if anyone had any con um, Exposure with Macuna purans, it's called the velvet bean. It's high in dopamine. I could, I could start with that, yeah. Um, in terms of experience directly, no. Uh, the amounts of dopamine, though, though high for foods, is low for everything else. So the amounts you're getting from eating Macuna purans or fava beans is really pretty negligible. Um, and uh, again, the whole point of any of these medications is to take them when you need them to address certain sp symptoms, and if you don't need them, why take it? So I, I tend to tell patients it's probably something they don't um, uh, necessarily need to worry about. If, if, if they need dopamine replacement, that's a discussion we should have, but I, I tend not, not to recommend they get it through uh, foods or other kinds of things specifically because the amounts are so small and variable. 
since everyone with Parkinson's, or most of us, have had issues with constipation, and it was just mentioned a moment ago, I decided that I was going to try and solve my own problem by not taking anything over the counter from a drugstore. I didn't want to have another pill or anything to take. So I did some research on the internet, and I thought, I can handle this with food. And here is my recipe that works for, for me. Every morning, I have yogurt with berries and granola. It makes a wonderful, healthy breakfast. And then before I go to bed every night, I take a forkful of sauerkraut, good sauerkraut in a jar. And I recommend, within a, a matter of a couple of weeks, my digestive system was working quite well. And that's a, just a suggestion that I thought maybe I could pass on to a few others. And my um, neurologist also recommended that I take my medication on an empty stomach. And I do that faithfully. And then not to eat any food for 30 minutes after taking that medication. Therefore, it gets into the upper part of the intestine a little more easily rather than being abstracted with, obstructed with food that might be in your stomach. I'll add sauerkraut to the list of recommendations I give people. <laughs> but only after the morning yogurt and granola. <laughs> what is your opinion about taking probiotics? Michelle, can you speak about probiotics <laughs> yeah, on behalf you know. of Dwart? So I, you know, I have a lot of patients who take them. I think they're a little bit controversial. Um, you know, it's interesting. People want to take probiotics because they're natural. Really, the natural thing to do is to shop on the outside of your grocery store and just eat food, right? Just eat real food. The less processed, the better. I find with Parkinson's patients, um, you know, you need to have the good natural fats to sort of lubricate the, the system. You got to have good natural fibers. I find when people try and take sort of imitation things, they don't work as well, right? So you try and take Metamucil in a system that's moving slowly and most people are not drinking enough water, where you create little bricks. It's not helpful, right? I mean, it, you know, not everything that is natural is good, but I think sometimes you need the real deal. You need to eat an apple. You need to eat some lettuce. You got to get some roughage. Um, you know, and so if you're really looking at, at sort of reestablishing a microbiome that is natural, my personal preference is to do it by not eating processed foods when and if possible. I don't know if you guys agree. No, absolutely. There's always a pyramid of... of of hierarchies of treatment options, right? And the first is to look at your lifestyle, especially for a lot of these non-motor symptoms. And constipation is one of the things that you have to do. You know, too often I will, uh, you know, sometimes I come across a patient who's on a prescription medication for constipation, and they say, oh, I'm still constipated. And I'll say, okay, well, are you doing all the other basic things that we know we have to do if we don't have Parkinson's to stay regular? And they're not drinking water, they're not varying their diet or doing anything. So the pill is not gonna do anything. That's the, the pyramid part of the piece all the layers of the pyramid are doing all those things we should all be doing. So absolutely, uh, there's a stepwise increment in, in a, approaching that treatment. And I always also tell patients that, <clears throat> you know, the staying hydrated is very important. Um, and I mean, it is difficult. Um, but I always tell patients if, you know, if you're going to use any of these over-the-counter medications, they're still not going to work very well unless you're hydrated. Um, and, and just like Amar saying, I mean, the, you know, some of the more prescription medications for constipation, they still don't really work that well unless you're hydrated. Um, so it really is an important part of, you know, treating the constipation as well as the lightheadedness. Just to talk about different recipes, everyone, you know, if you Google different recipes, everyone has their own little strategy. I know I was talking to Mike Oaken at Florida one time at a conference and you know he's got his published recipe of bran and prune juice and yes. you make a batch of it and you keep it for two weeks and you take two spoonfuls every day. I love that. I give that to everyone. It's, it's perfect. Um, it's a nice, that's a first step, right? It's, it's You find that, on, so the National Parkinson's Foundation has um, a little, it's a green booklet on nutrition and it's actually right in that booklet. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And you make a batch and it lasts two weeks and it's really, it's just a mixture of prune juice and um, granola and uh, some kind uh, yeah. of Muller's brand, wheat, Muller's oat Muller's brand. brand fiber, yeah. prune juice. Unprocessed and, fiber. Yeah, it's great. So, and you make a big slurry and then you, you titrate. Exactly. It's great. 
Um, and if then that doesn't work, now you add something else. You add, you change your, your other diet, you add maybe a, a separate amount of fiber on a different day, maybe you add some Senecot or Colase to soften the stools and promote motion, but it's, everything builds on itself. I think I wanna say too though, a lot of people wait until they're very constipated to start trying to treat their constipation. Yeah. And the problem is that you are quite literally behind the eight ball, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pun intended. And now what you've got to do is create back pressure to get that out. And so what typically follows that is diarrhea. And then people will say, well, I can't take these things because then I get diarrhea. And really what you need to do if you've got Parkinson's is be very regimented. And if you're going to take the stuff, you take it every day. You don't wait until you're constipated because it is too late and then your pendulum is going to swing between constipation and then diarrhea, which is then going to dehydrate you back to constipation and it's a nasty cycle. Eight ball and the three ball. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, you know we talk about it, and in all seriousness, if you look at the motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, sometimes those non-motor symptoms have more impact on the quality of life than you know a, a, a resting tremor that goes away with action. Constipation's a big problem. It's uncomfortable. You get bloating. Your medication's not going to get absorbed as well. It may interfere with your sleep. It may make it so you can't exercise as well. So it's really important. Regulates um, my day. Yeah, and then today you, was a no-go day. It was a no-go. <laughs> you know, Good and. Thing I, for pills today. <laughs> and I know we drive people crazy with the water and you say, well, I can't open my pants and I can't get to the toilet in time and I'm already peeing 10 times a night. I want to kick you. So we know, we know, we're, you know, we're, we're aware, so we, but you still got to increase it as best you can. If you, if you got those eight balls, you, you know, you drink a lot of water. Would one of you comment on the physiology of exercise in the brain and how it actually if it does, I guess it does, help the brain, and you're saying 180 minutes, if you do more than that, if you add a lot to that, is that going to help make new pathways? So um, I'll say that you know there are known changes in the brain with aerobic exercise. Um, so you know, one of them is just helping the brain use whatever dopamine is there more efficiently. Um, so even though you don't have the same level of dopamine naturally in your brain, um, you are most people are still making at least a little bit. Um, at some point, that probably dwindles down. Um, but whatever is still naturally there, um, it you know it increases the efficiency that your brain uses this dopamine. Um, there's also some studies showing that you actually grow new receptors, so new dopamine receptors. Um, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure if, if you, I'm not sure what the correlation is if you're exercising, you know, mega amounts. I, I don't know, to be honest, if that produces even more of a benefit. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. For me, it's 50 minutes a day, if I could do it. Yeah, I think we only know with the precision that exercise is better than no exercise. And after that, it's kind of what you can do and what you can build up to. Mm -hmm. So it's very individualized. And I think it, we, we know it has a, uh, there's been a lot of research in the last few years about things like epigenetics. So what does your activity, lifestyle, how does that send signals to your body to change your gene expression? And there seems to be positive epigenetic phenomenon with exercise in relation to both Parkinson's and things like Alzheimer's, to turn off genes that maybe increase your risk of those conditions and turn on genes that reduce your risk. So um, uh, there's immediate effects, there may be long-term effects, there may be plastic effects and changing things. So it's, it, it really is a, a multimodal way of working. Um, when we were talking about diet, I did hear during, during the discussions about um, high protein depleting dopamine if you eat, eat high protein diet. Someone, well, I, I, um, I'm a type one diabetic on an insulin pump, so I'm already dealing with, you know, so obviously proteins and fiber is basically where I, <laughs> what I'm supposed to have. I mean, do I always know? But, <laughs> um, but I don't eat pasta <laughs> or rice. <laughs> but um, so I wanted to know. Sauerkraut's okay. Sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. I'm, I, I actually um, handle the constipation with Miralax and because uh, that brings moisture to the bowel and so I, I do that on a regular mm. thing. So that part I'm okay with. But I'm <laughs> wondering about what you do, I mean, if, if protein is a restriction. 
Right, right. So we're not, you know, when we talk about protein restrictions, it's not really a total daily protein restriction. Some people find that they're quite sensitive to the um, competition that occurs between levodopa and protein in terms of absorption. So if you have a big old steak and you take your levodopa, you potentially are not going to be absorbing right that whole pill. There, it, early on in the disease, and I think someone had mentioned this earlier, you know, some people have been advised to take the medication on an empty stomach. In a perfect world, yes, you would take it on an empty stomach so you wouldn't have delayed gastric emptying, you wouldn't have problems with protein competition. Um, but for most of our patients, nausea is a huge concern. If you actually look at what Cinemet, like the brand name means, Cin means without, Emet means vomiting. The, the name of the medication means without vomiting. It's a big problem. So most of us will advise our patients, I hope no one would disagree, but initially to at least take it with some low protein based foods, some carbohydrates. Um, there are some people who are quite sensitive and so sometimes we recommend a protein redistribution diet, meaning that you would still have your total daily dosage of protein, but you would do it sort of later in the day or at a time when you needed to be less mobile, right? So the encouragement is not to eliminate protein from your diet, but rather to just try and separate it as best you can from the dosages of levodopa specifically. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you all for sharing your expertise with everyone. It's so valuable. But I do have a question that we've been hearing about kind of on the just um, people talking. Cannabis oil, the CBD, some people have said that it helps them uh, with their freezing and other aspects of um, Parkinson's symptoms. Could you address that? Um, you know, anecdotally, I certainly have m many patients, as we probably all do, who have at least tried it. Um, some patients do take it regularly. Just in my experience, I, you know, I have not heard from patients that it helps so much with any physical symptoms, um, and you guys, you know, can answer that as well. But, f f you know, the patients have told me, for the most part, it can help with sleeping, um, can help with anxiety. Um, those are probably the top two um, symptoms that I have heard um, have been helpful. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of ongoing studies looking at CBD oil. I mean, right now it's, you know, there's no formal recommendation for use in Parkinson's, even though it is approved um, in certain states. Um, but I don't know what your guys' experience has been. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always tough to advise patients because we can't refer to a compendium and say, you know, percentage of patients will get this, this, and this benefit. and. X, Y, and Z side effects. So uh, a lot of it is just what our patients tell us when they've tried it. And so there are different formulations. There are people who try CBD oils or other things that are pure CBD that they get just uh, in stores or, or online. Then there are others who are certified through the state program and they get a mix of either CBD or THC based on what they've spoken with the dispensary pharmacist about their symptoms. So it's a, it's a real variety of symptoms. I would tend to agree with Sarah that the probably uh, you know, I can think of uh, patients who have said that they've had benefit. It's usually about just feeling comfort at night or sleep at night or dealing with some anxiety. Uh, in physical symptoms, sometimes they've reported, oh, you know what, my aches or pains are a little bit better. You know, if they have a bad back or a bad uh, knee and that's limiting them, they don't really notice so much in the stiffness or slowness of Parkinson's. But now, because some of their aches and pains are a little bit better managed, they're, they're just a bit more mobile. And then, as many people tell me, you know, I tried it for a month or two. It was kind of expensive. I didn't see any difference, so I stopped it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big mix. Probably dyskinesia, I think, nationally might be the most reliable Parkinson-specific um, symptom that people report a benefit for. But again, it's hard to know because these are just, you know, self-reports of, of how they felt without any placebo controls or other large-scale trials. Um, I will say, you know, if you YouTube things like that, you'll see dramatic videos of people with dyskinesia who then take CBD or THC and dramatically improve. Um, you always want to take those with a grain of salt. That's one person's experience. but. Um, it may have a role, um, but it's really, it's really tough to say. Mar, in 1968, it seemed to do the same thing. It relieved the anxiety and helped me sleep. It's nice that you chose 68. I think that's, what, it's, <laughs> right. that's when levodopa was, I think, FDA approved. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've had a similar, I mean, I've had a similar experience. I think Amar and I were on a panel last summer, right? There were yeah. seven of us, six or seven of us movement disorder specialists from the state, and all of us had the same response. We haven't seen the sort of or shattering results that it helps a little bit with anxiety, maybe some sleep, maybe a little appetite, maybe a little bit with pain, but certainly not the real, true, you know, sort of symptoms of Parkinson's. And if you look at the list of neurological conditions that it's approved for, there's Parkinson's, MS, stroke, 
um, failed back syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, so these are all neurological or related conditions that cause pain, stiffness, immobility, but they all have very different mechanisms. So it's hard to imagine that cannabis has a specific disease effect for any one of these things. It probably has a symptomatic effect. So it's nice that we have options or that people are looking into you know, what it can actually help. But um, certainly, I don't think anybody's missing out if they're um, you know, not, not on CBD or anything specifically for Parkinson's. <laughs> Yes, hello. Uh, I had a question for you guys. Uh, if you had any, any experience with this, but any of these Parkinson's medications, have you had experience mixing these with other medications from other problems that people might have had, like from immunosuppressive drugs? Um, do you mean to try to use both of them at the same time for Parkinson's, or do you um, just having patients who are, happen to be on both? Patients who have had, uh, you know, a, a organ transplant and on immunosuppressive drugs, and how, what are the effects of taking any of these Parkinson's drugs with that? Generally, the nice thing about Parkinson's drugs and levodopa in particular is that it has really few interactions with almost anything. So uh, just without knowing any specifics about a particular patient or their immunosuppressive status, we, we really use things independently uh, from those agents. Um, and, and we wouldn't anticipate there's necessarily specific interactions. Yeah. There's a fellow from Brantford who just had DVS who had a liver transplant. Mm. Okay. I and if you, means, yeah. I, yeah, I've got a couple of patients who are post transplant, and um, if you know, we, you know, we try not to poke the skunk, right? So I'm not going to pick a medication I know that's metabolized by the liver if I have another choice, and a dopamine agonist you do. Um, got some kidney transplant patients, and we just sort of make smart decisions. They're followed pretty closely. I wouldn't recommend someone who was on immunosuppression for an anti opposite nucleon immunization trial. You wouldn't qualify anyway. But otherwise, our medications are not you know, immunomodulatory, you know, like the multiple sclerosis medications, you'd be in a different boat, right, where you are working on the immune system, but with our Parkinson's medications, that's not the case, so we tend not to really run into that. Uh, I want to make a comment. Carl is running the CAP group, which, we, which sponsors this, and his wife, Michelle, would you please stand up? Right. Hello. And Michelle. And Steve DeWitt standing back to started this whole group. Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, on behalf of CAP, I want to thank Allison Kinney, who was one of our board members. Why don't you stand up, Allison, for running this fine event? And Ray, for hosting it, it again. Awesome job. Um, one thing I can say about Parkinson's, my wife was diagnosed 11 years ago. And there's a lot of brave people out there not giving up. Ray, Allison, Steve over here, um, Michelle. So if you get diagnosed, there's a lot of living left in you. I'm sure of it. These, these guys are living proof of it. So if you're first diagnosed, exercise, exercise, exercise. My wife runs um, BPT today. Um, she's still working as a phys ed teacher 11 years after diagnosis. So it's something to be said for exercise. So exercise, be optimistic, and a cure is coming, I'm sure of it. So thank you. Yes, we're all set. I want to thank everybody for coming today. And I hope I see you all at the Bamford Road Race next week and either to walk or run. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Mo. I go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Thanks, Kara.